to uh, tell us where they're logging in from. It's always nice to see where people are coming from. So, okay, the doors are open, guys. Another version of uh, Prism Rounds back up at again. We got uh, two great presenters. Uh, I think it's going to be a really nice uh, teaching experience for everybody here. Sorry, just repeated myself there on the YouTube. So I, I thought, you know, usually what we do beforehand, we'd like to get uh, just an idea where people are coming from. You know, feel free to use the chat, uh, the chat window there to message us where you're coming from. Um, and maybe because we have some of our speakers already, we have Amadeep and Devinder, Rosa, and Elisa, Tom, and I know Leon will be joining us shortly. So, <laughs> Devinder, are you, are you at home or are you in the office? Um, I'm in the office. I just finished up clinic. Uh, things are slowly, um, slowly ramping back up. You know, in, in Texas, our, our governor has opened everything up and um, things are, you know, back to normal. But, uh, but we're, we're slowly, slowly ramping things back up um, and still trying to keep everybody safe and be safe. And Annalisa, what's it like in Florida? Are you guys, are, are patients coming to see you? I mean, your doors are open, but are patients like still coming or are reluctant to come in during this time? It is. The average in our practice is around 50% of the scheduled patients. And so it's, it's pretty significant. And surgery is a challenge. They may come to clinic, but they don't want to get caught. On. What about you, Rosa? How have you been spending your time? I do a lot of teleconferencing with patients that are worried as you know it's pretty hard to you know, make a diagnosis over the phone but you know being able to at least have EMR thank goodness and have access from home has made it a bit easier and I can just call patients back and then today I went in and saw about seven urgent patients that just I didn't want to leave any longer um, and so I've been going in maybe once every few weeks just to see a few people and then today took me a long time. It took me an hour and a half to see seven people because I'm doing a full clean down of the room after each patient, you know, and, um, and trying to keep them apart from each other. So it's very interesting to hear about Texas going back to the normal. I don't think in Canada we'll go back to normal. Do you like, I think it'll be a new normal, which is going to be different. Yeah. I mean, yeah no, go, go ahead, Devinder. Oh yeah, no. I mean, I think I think I think you're 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 dead on. I mean, it's there. You know, there were a couple of restaurants in Dallas that basically said, you know, we're no one in our restaurants wearing masks, and if you don't like it, then don't come to a restaurant. But I think no, without question, I think around the world, our society has been been changed. So I mean, we're still instating all these things, but they're they're I think they're really focused on opening it, and I'm hoping they're going to be able to do that in a, in the safest way possible. Hey, Leon. Yeah, me too. Hey, guys. Good to see you, buddy. Yes. Tom, Tom are you, are you, have you started doing surgery? Have you started back to cataract surgery? Yes, we, at the university, we started back um, a couple weeks ago, and, uh, uh, and we are probably about 50%. Uh, at the VA, though, we're, we're, the two VAs we have, we're, we're closed on okay. Wow. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I agree, Rose. I mean, in Canada, I think we're, I'm not sure if anybody's gone back really to routine surgery. And I think it's probably going to be another few weeks, I think, probably three, four weeks before we're in Canada, I think we're back. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I think we're taking, it, we're taking it kind of slow and steady and, and kind of uh, waiting for us to see a few more reductions in, in, the, in the numbers. So it's been, it's, been, it's been really fun to go back. And, and uh, what we've been doing is we, we do COVID testing the day before. And then, um, and then we do the surgery. But when we do the surgery, we don't have family members come. So the family members have to hang out uh, somewhere else. And it's, it's really been kind of uh, nice to have less people asking questions. And uh, just, <laughs> we had, we had uh, some, some folks come uh, recently and I, and I uh, called up their, their wife after the surgery and I said, I just want you to thank me. I kept him all day today for you. You didn't have to mess with him the whole day and you owe us for this, right? And, uh, <laughs> Really, it's really uh, it's really been surprisingly good, and um, uh, and then they're very appreciative of the COVID test, very appreciative, even though it's only good for like a day, but they're still excited to know they're negative. You're doing it in the office right there. Uh, we have a drive-by in the hospital, so they just have to drive up and get it, and then drive away, so they never have to get out. Great. So I think we'll get started. We've got, a, we've got a nice group of attendees all over the world, Poland, Spain, Uganda, London, India, Oman, Portugal, 
Egypt, Jordan, so uh, California, Ukraine, Denmark, so and Antigua. Great, good to see Antigua's always there. Fantastic. Well, we always have a bit of a rowdy group on the chat group, so I'm gonna get our panelists to be watching these guys. Last time it got pretty, uh, it got pretty uh, intense, which was great to see everyone contributing. Uh, so I want to welcome you all again to another edition of Prism Eye Rounds. We've been doing this uh, now for the last couple of months now, actually, and started off a small group, and it's kind of grown. We keep it pretty casual, as you know, and try to get some, uh, you know, wonderful teachers and panelists to share their thoughts. Um, I'm particularly happy today. We have, uh, you know, an amazing group of people here today. I'm really privileged to have my colleagues with us here to contribute. Uh, and our two topics today are, are on cataract and, and on glaucoma. Um, I'm going to have uh, Jeb Ong, as he usually does, start off with a few little administrative notes, and then we'll get into the presentation. So, Jeb. Perfect. So, thanks, everybody, again, for joining us uh, on this Wednesday afternoon. Uh, brief reminder, our website is www.prisminstitute.com slash webinars. And for any questions, comments, or if, you, you know, if you're interested in presenting, please email us at ike.webinars at prismi.ca. Now, officially, our rounds are accredited, accredited now, starting May 6th. So the sessions prior to that, unfortunately, um, they were not yet accredited. I know I've been getting a lot of questions about that in terms of certificates of attendance. Um, so you're only be, you're only going to be able to, to claim 2.0 hours starting the May 6 sessions. Um, and yeah, so essentially what happens is after the webinar, a day after, you're going to get an email. There's going to be a form you can fill out to get your certificate. And also when you log off the, um, the, the Zoom meeting today, you're going to be uh, led to a survey. Please feel free to give us some comments, feedback. So just a uh, brief uh, note here on May 16th, this Saturday, we do not have any PRISM I rounds because there's ASCRS. So we are only gonna be resuming on May 20th. And we are changing the time because people are slowly <coughs> coming up. It's gonna be at 6 p.m. Eastern time and no longer at 3 p.m. That's gonna be on the website as well, but that's just something to keep uh, in mind, okay? So our first speaker today is Dr. Amandeep Rai, who is a cataract surgeon and comprehensive ophthalmologist at the Kensington and Prism Eye Institutes. He's also the Associate Program Director of the University of Toronto Residency Program. That's also where he did his residency. Uh, on the panel today, we have Dr. Thomas Oding, who's pretty well known in, in, the, um, in the ophthalmology community in terms of education. He's the Margaret and Rudy Perez Pro Professor of Ophthalmology uh, Education at the University of Iowa. Yeah, he's also the Residency Program Director there and he's the Chief of Ophthalmology at the Iowa City BAMC. We also have Dr. Rosa Bragamelli, who's the, uh, sorry about that, is a professor of ophthalmology at the University of Toronto. She did her residency at the University of Toronto as well. She's also completed a master's in higher education. She's currently the editor of the cataract section for iWorld, and she certainly distinguished herself with uh, numerous teaching awards. Our second speaker today is Dr. Devinder Grover. He's an attending surgeon and clinician at Glaucoma Associates of Texas. He's also the director of research there. He did his glaucoma fellowship at Bascom Palmer in uh, Miami. And he's also completed a master's of public health at Harvard University School of Public Health. On his panel, we have Dr. Leon Herndon, who's the chief of the glaucoma division at the Duke University Eye Center. He's also the chair of the glaucoma clinical committee of the ASCRS, and he's a professor of ophthalmology at Duke University. We also have Dr. Annalisa Arosemena, who is a glaucoma and complex cataract surgeon in Miami, Florida. She's previously completed a glaucoma and anterior segment fellowship with Dr. Ayala, and she did her residency at Tulane University in uh, New Orleans. I hope I said that properly because I actually YouTubed that earlier. Oh, Go ahead, New Orleans. <laughs> Thank you, Jab. We'll, we'll get Amadeep to maybe uh, load up your slides, Amadeep, if you don't mind. So. Yeah, our first our first set our first session is uh, run by Amandeep Rai. Amandeep uh, was just a recent graduate actually from University of Toronto and has rapidly ascended uh, now in uh, teaching uh, as well as the research that he's doing and the presence he has in the community. Uh, Amandeep is now the associate program director at University of Toronto. A real passion for teaching. You know, the theme here I think and everybody here is really teaching and education, uh, and and we thank Amandeep for doing that. Amandeep has. Have particular interest in in uh, resident teaching and cataract uh, teaching in the OR as well as IOL calculations that we often uh, butt heads over. So I'm looking forward to hearing some of these uh, everyday cases, but but uncommon uh, catches. I also want to thank, of course, uh, both Rosa and Tom. I, I think there's probably two two no more well known educators uh, in cataract education than these two, uh, who have a long history of uh, contributing to our field and organizing meetings and educating residents. Um, I'm lucky enough to work in Toronto with Rosa and lucky enough to know Tom well. We had him up here, of course, as well recently in Toronto uh, at our cataract course. So uh, thank you both for coming in. 
we're going to keep it pretty casual. So, you know, interrupt Amandeep, uh, ask questions, make up points, whatever you need to do. And of course, from the uh, attendee group, we've got about 400 plus people on, on both our platforms. Uh, feel free to enter some uh, comments if you wish. We'll try to get to them and in your questions as well. So Amadeep, take it away, buddy. Thanks so much for, for being here today. All right. Thank you, Ike. Can you guys see my slides okay? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So um, my name is Amandeep Rai, and I'll be talking about cataract surgery and some everyday cases with uncommon catches. Uh, as Ike has already alluded to, the first thing I want to do is acknowledge my panelists. So Rosa Bragamelli has been a friend and mentor to me for years now, and she was an amazing cataract teacher of mine when I was a senior resident, and I'm truly honored to have her here today. And Tom Oding is someone I only met a couple months ago at the Toronto Cataract course, but I've learned from him for many years due to his wonderful online presence. So he really was ahead of the curve with virtual learning. And Ike, of course, has been a brother and a mentor to me to, uh, throughout the years. And again, I'd like to thank him for this opportunity today. I also want to acknowledge the incredible hard work that Jeb has been doing to make these rounds successful. So thank you, Jeb, for all that you, you've been doing the last few months. Um, the Raptors, as a reminder, are still NBA champions. And before we start, I just want to acknowledge a, a, a heritage moment for Canada. Yesterday was the one year anniversary of the shot. Uh, so let's quickly relive it. Got it. <laughs> it's incredible what a difference a year makes, but brighter days are ahead. So I, I want to talk about a little bit more history. So uh, some in the audience may even remember this now infamous headline, Dewey defeats Truman. The Chicago Daily Tribune definitely remembers this headline. They had went to press earlier than most other newspapers. So based on widespread conventional wisdom and the expert opinion of their pollsters, they felt comfortable calling the 1948 US presidential election in favor of Dewey. There's just one problem here. This happy smiling face, not Dewey. This is Harry Truman, the 33rd president of the United States who was reelected that night in 1948. The pollsters, it seemed, got it wrong. And so you may be thinking that, you know what, this is a retro phenomenon from days gone by before the internet. Well, you're wrong. Here's the Marquis Chalgemin, a German newspaper who went to press November 9th, 2016 and declared Hillary Clinton the president elect of the United States. And who could blame them? Every major mainstream pollster had predicted the election in her favor from traditional media such as the New York Times and CNN to new media such as the Huffington Post but we all know how that turned out. So what does this have to do with cataract surgery? Well, in our practice on a near daily basis, we encounter patients who want refractive cataract surgery. And they tell us that they refuse to wear glasses under any circumstances whatsoever. And we've come a long way from the discovery of the intraocular lens to the invention of FACO, to the introduction of optical biometry. And now we are in pursuit of the holy grail of cataract surgery which is the accurate preoperative prediction of the postoperative effective lens position. So how do we pick IOLs? Well, we're all very familiar with the IOL Mr. Printout and its variety of formulas. And truly we talk about these as IOL calculations, but in reality, these are not calculations. These are simply predictions of the postoperative refraction. And Holiday and Hagus and Hoffer Q and SRK, they're all just pollsters. If we actually knew the post-operative effective lens position, we could do a simple vergence calculation to predict the IOL power. But instead we're predicting and relying on pollsters and pollsters can get it wrong. So today I'm going to talk to you about conventional wisdoms and the new school of pollsters. When I was first starting out in cataract surgery only a few years ago with Rosa and Ike, uh, we used to talk about using the Hoffer Q for short eyes, the Holiday for average eyes and the SRK for long eyes with or without the Wang Cloak modification. Recently, Mellis and his group published a very well done study in the Blue Journal. It was the largest study of its kind looking at refractive outcomes following cataract surgery. They looked at 18,000 eyes from 145 surgeons from a diverse Northern California population. They implanted about 5,000 SA60 AT lenses and 13,000 SN60 WF lenses, again, representative of many of our surgical practices. And what did they find? Well, Here's the first graph and the, the bars represent post-operative prediction error. So the difference between the predicted refraction and the actual stable post-operative refraction. Uh, bars above the y-axis represent hyperopic error and below the y-axis is myopic error. 
this graph represents the roughly 80% of the eyes that were of average axial length. So say between 22.5 and 25.5 millimeters. And as we know from clinical practice, these eyes tend to do very well with cataract surgery. And that was borne out in these results here. Every formula was within 0.1 diopters of the intended target. I mean, Deep, sorry to interrupt you. Um, you know the option to uh, optimize sharing? Can you yep. remove it for a second? Because we've noticed that it actually affects the clarity of your slides. Maybe just sure. do it with you. How's that? Yeah, it looks a lot better already. Yeah. Okay, great. perfect. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Much better. Nice Thank call, you. Nice call, Jeff. Thank you. So um, once we go to the extremes of axial length, that's typically where we see uh, refractive errors with cataract surgery. So uh, let's start with short eyes. Short eyes were those with axial length less than 22.5 and represented about 10% of the patient population. And as you can see here, there's much greater variability in the post-operative prediction error across the different formulas. Now here, Barrett did do the best. And the other thing I'll point out is against conventional wisdom, Hoffer Q was actually the worst performing formula in this data set. And let's look at the other extreme of axial length. And that's eyes greater than 25.5 millimeters, which were also about 10% of the eyes in this study. Uh, the lowest prediction error belonged to the Olsen, while the Barrett was second. There's a couple other interesting tidbits that this data demonstrates. First of all, we've long known that the Wang Coke modification is a bit of a fudge factor. And that's what the data shows here. What it does is it takes a hyperopic error, which is certainly not desirable, but and turns it into a myopic error, which is more acceptable, but still not great. The Baird and the Olsen uh, outperform the other formulas, even with the Wang Coke modification. Now you might be thinking that it's not all about axial length and you're right. Predicting the effective lens position should take into account a variety of ocular parameters. And we'll start with keratometry, which is probably the second most important after axial length. As you can see in the middle of this graph, average Ks between 43 and 45, all the formulas do very well. But as soon as we get outside of that, look at the black sloping line. That represents the SRKT, or the yellow line represents the Hagus, or the green line represents the Hoffer Q. These are sloped lines. This means that they are less reliable with atypical K values. Now, I will point out that these extreme K values are actually not that extreme. We routinely see Ks as flat as 40 or as steep as 48 in otherwise healthy eyes. And if you look at the maroon line representing the Barrett formula, it's relatively flat and that's good. It's similar in the next two slides as well. So looking here at anterior chamber depth, again, in the middle of the um, chart with anterior chamber depth between three and 3.5, all the formulas do very well. But if you look at formulas such as the Olsen, the Hoffer Q, and the Holiday, they tend to have slope lines, meaning they're less accurate with the extremes of AC depth, while the bear maintains a relatively flat profile. And again, with lens thickness, with average lens thickness, around four and a half millimeters, all the formulas do quite well. But if you get to the extremes, formulas like the Hagus and the Holiday, too, are less reliable, while the Barrett, once again, maintains a relatively flat profile. So overall, I would say we're doing quite well. With average eyes, all the formulas tend to shine. And even when we look at all comers, which includes the atypical eyes, regardless of which formula you choose, over 70% of your patients will be within a half diopter of the intended target. And that's pretty good. Now in this study, the Barrett Universal 2 was the only formula that actually went beyond the 80% threshold of having eyes within a half diopter of the refractive target. So we've done it. The answer to all your biometry questions is Barrett, right? Wrong. The, the, the same authors actually went back and looked at the same data set. And this time they used two new formulas, the Kane and the Olsen. So the Olsen was in the original study, but it used two factors to predict the ELP, which was the AC depth and the lens thickness. This time they went back and they looked, with, they looked with the four factor Olsen, which is using AC depth, lens thickness, corneal curvature and axial length to predict the ELP. And this resulted in improved accuracy. So this formula was actually better than the Barrett in terms of being within a half diopter of the intended target. And the Kane formula, which is a new formula, was within 83, was within a half diopter of the intended target 83% of the time. So that was the highest in this new data set. And the Kane formula also had the lowest standard deviation, the lowest mean absolute error and lowest median absolute error, and was the most accurate for short, medium, and long eyes. And this was borne out in another study uh, published by Kane and his group 
uh, looking at 10,000 eyes from the National Health Service. The, the cane formula had the lowest error for short eyes, medium eyes, and long eyes, and had the lowest mean and median absolute error. Okay, so you, and, and it also had the highest percentage of eyes within a half diopter of the intended target. So you must be thinking, well, okay, the answer to everything is now cane. <laughs> and again, I would say not quite. Uh, the Hill RBF is another fantastic formula. And in addition to giving us an uh, IOL power, it has a very cool boundary feature. It takes your patient's biometry and compares it to the data set that it, it has compared, sorry, that it, it has encountered in the past. So if you have an average eye, chances are it'll be in bounds, but an atypical eye may be out of bounds. And with the boundary model, a result that is in bounds means you have a 90% chance of being within a half diopter of the intended target. And a result outside this boundary cannot give this level of confidence. Now, some may think of out of bounds as a limitation or the boundary mo model as a limitation, but I actually think it's a great feature. I sort of think, of, think of it like the polls. So for our, our uh, non-Canadian friends, Justin Trudeau did win this election, despite what these pollsters were saying. And if you look at the bottom right, it says, you know what, this poll is accurate to within 2.9 percentage points, 19 times out of 20. Well, the Hill RBF is very clever in that it helps you preoperatively identify patients who are more likely to be that one in 20. Those patients who are out of bounds are more likely to have significant refractive error. And you may adjust your IOL power or even your IOL type based on this. Uh, and you may have a longer discussion with patients and make sure you accordingly adjust expectations. Okay, so, <laughs> um, I don't know if Tom or Rosa have any thoughts before we get into some cases. Well, I, no, I just I think... comment briefly on the Kane formula. We, we had a, uh, when Kane came out with this paper, we were lucky to review it in our residency for um, uh, iWorld. And, uh, and he was a really engaging, uh, wonderful young fellow. I mean, he's, he, he's very, he's a very young guy. I mean, he was doing a lot of this when he was a resident. And it, what's cool about it to me is it shows just how much impact you can have uh, if you sort of throw, away, if you don't really know as much about the history or throw away the history and just sort of jump into it from with a fresh start. And I think that was exciting uh, thing about him. Um, it was kind of a weird meeting because it was, we were just beginning to use Zoom. And after a while, the residents were so enamored with uh, Dr. Kane that they started asking him questions about like, well, what do you eat for breakfast in the morning? And <laughs> he was just like, totally off track by his charisma. But the, the, uh, it, the most exciting thing about that is how can something like that just come out of the blue, boom, and, um, and be so good. So I, I, that, that's, that, that gives me, gives me uh, the, the exciting idea that there's more things like that out there. Okay, so let's move on to case one. So this is my son here, and he's very excited about biometry. And so here's an example uh, of a case where the aforementioned formulas and the biometry become very relevant. So this is a very real life application. We have a short eye, so uh, short by most of our standards, maybe not short by Ike standards, but this is the axial hyperope. <laughs> and this patient has a high degree of corneal astigmatism. And right off the bat, this is an eye, even without the Hill RBF, that we sort of know is higher risk of refractive error. And uh, I pulled the um, Barrett online TOR calculators results here. And it recommends a 35 and a half diopter T6 for the right eye and a 35 and a half diopter T7 for the left eye. And I don't know if anyone notices any issues with that. Well, the, the issue with these lenses is that they're not commercially available, right? So I think it's important that we, we kind of know these things when we're, when we're chatting with our patients and counseling patients, because you don't want to make promises that you can't keep. And so, Commercially available IOLs go up to, toric IOLs uh, typically go up to about 34 diopters. And so once you get beyond this, um, they're not commercially available. So you won't have these in your consignment. So you got to know these things when you're, when you're seeing patients in your clinic. Okay. Uh, for this patient, I also did do the Hill RBF formula and it had called for a 34 diopter IOL. So going back 35 and a half from Barrett and 34 for Hill RBF. And these are newer generation formulas and they're disagreeing with one another. The Hill RBF threw up a bunch of caution signs. You can see the alerts there. And it's, it's putting its hands up and saying, you know what, this eye is out of bounds. Uh, it's not sort of represented uh, in the data set. And that data set, by the way, does get better with time as you add more and more cases. But at the time, this eye was not in bounds. And so 
I mean, I typically use the Barrett and I plan to use the Barrett here uh, and the Hill RBF was not expressing confidence. I don't know if the panelists have any thoughts on that. So what would you, what would you do here? I'd probably do a bit more, if I had that much discrepancy, um, and did you do topography as well? Were, were the Ks lining up on multiple K testings, I'm in deep? Yeah, and yeah, so the, so the axis was, was, was regular and it was consistent. Okay, so this is a lot of astigmatism and in some ways, well, you can get special order high um, hyper, like a high um, diopter lens from, from some companies that are available with the astigmatism correction on them. Um, it is a large amount of astigmatism to put in a 35 and then do an LRI or an AK on, a toric lens would be much more stable. And if I had one telling me 34 and one telling me 35, with hyperopic eyes, I don't know about you, Tom, but I tend to like to err on the side of a little bit residual hyperopia. They don't tend to mind it. I would never do that with a myop or a plano patient, but this was, a, I'm assuming, a very high hyperopic eye to begin with. They were used to wearing a high hyperopic prescription. And so for the advantage of correcting the astigmatism, I might leave or see if they would be uh, a little bit more hyperopic. What I find is the higher number you go, the more likelihood that you're gonna overshoot. And I do prefer the Hill RBF or um, others over the Barrett for a very high hyperopic eye with this kind of like here, you're also your Ks are out of range as well from what your graphs were before. So you're dealing with very different Ks. Um, and then you could always do a touch up LASIK or PRK on them afterwards if they do end up hyperopic. Perfect, thank you. So, I mean, really, really good points. I mean, for me at the time, I wasn't, using Hill RBF routinely and it, it had thrown up some caution signs um, and I was very comfortable with the Barrett. So um, again, after lengthy discussion with the family and they won the cataracts, the cataracts were also visually significant so they didn't want to wait. We did go ahead with a uh, 35 diopter IQ lens in each eye. Uh, and you can see here, um, it had called for 35 for roughly Plano, but here's the stable post-op refraction. And this patient ended up with compound myopic astigmatism the right eye was about one and a half diopters myopic and the left eye was minus 1.25 in terms of spherical equivalent. So I did actually go back and I ran the cane formula for this patient. And the cane oh, formula, uh, <laughs> surprise, surprise, called for a 34 <laughs> in the right eye and a 33 and a half to 34, depending on your preference for the left eye. And so um, this is relevant because I think um, for a long time, the answer to everything was Barrett, but you know what? the Hill and Kane kind of agreed with each other. And I probably, I mean, I, going back, I, I could have offered her a uh, 34 diopter IOL, achieved a, a plano spherical equivalent, and also offered her torque correction. You know, I was so, thinking, yeah. I was thinking what Rose said was, was, was really a good idea. And that is the idea of you're basically trading off um, some uncertainty over uh, the uh, spherical equivalent of the lens versus correcting the astigmatism. And um, my experience with hyperopes, like probably everybody else, is they're so happy to be close that uh, they're like, like the greatest patients in the world because they just want to get close, at least, at least the ones in Iowa do. And um, so I do, think it, I do think that with looking backwards, um, even if you thought the Barrett was right, you could, you could make a strong argument for putting a 34 in with the astigmatic correction. And, and they end up plus one or something like that, or plus one and a half. And, and, and so it's, would you rather be that or would you rather be, um, you know, Plano with the sill? And uh, so I, I, think, I, I think possibly I would have done that. Now it's easy to say that now, but I pro probably would have maybe gone for the torque, assuming the Barrett was right, assuming I was gonna end up plus one. Uh, and then I think they'd be pretty happy. And then, uh, and then the other thing is, I think with the consent with patients like this that are at the, at the border, uh, of what we uh, really understand with our formulas, um, I think you you tell patients we may do an exchange, and uh, and we're doing the best we can, but we may do an exchange, and and so you lower their expectations for perfection a little bit. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, thank you. I mean, we I did consider that. The other uh, other thing, of course, is cost of IOLs, and uh, when I wasn't going to be able to deliver, I think 
and um, just their expectations were very reasonable. So we went ahead with that, but I totally, I mean, in retrospect, I wish I um, ha had that hindsight, but hindsight <laughs> is twenty twenty, as they say. So um, I, I guess I'll wrap up this case by just saying, you know, over the last few years, um, the answer to every biometry question has quickly become Barrett. Uh, but I think it's important that we, number one, understand all the various Barrett formulas, and then also understand what other newer generation formulas are available to us and how they may uh, be unique from one another and help us in different circumstances. Okay, so we're gonna move on to case two. And uh, I think my, son's, my son here is ready for some surgical videos. So this is a patient of mine. I operated on him about six weeks before this photo was taken. And he presented with persistent post-op iritis. And every time we try to uh, taper his steroids, uh, there's, a, there's a flare. Of note, you do, you do see it's a white eye, clear cornea around pupil. And here's, I don't know how well this projects. I, I hope you can see it. It projects uh, well, it does. Okay. <laughs> it's a yep. slit lamp photograph with retroillumination <laughs> and you can see transillumination defects. And at this point, I'm going to ask Jeb to launch the first poll. Um, but in the meanwhile, we can uh, um, ask the panelists what they think is going on here. Oh. Maybe you can put it back to the picture, uh, Amadeep. So oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, attendees can attendees can review that. Well, obviously, there's something going on that's chafing the iris, and so I guess my question, first question, would be: This wasn't there before the surgery was done, um, um, like in a PXFI or anything like that, because it is a young male, if I remember you saying what the case was, maybe I'm wrong. But I'm, I'm thinking there's something chafing the iris. So I would want to know if you've done um, any testing on him, like a post-op UVM, to see if both your haptics are in the bag. If this is a single piece um, IOL, are your haptics in the bag? And how small this eye was as well, like what the AC depth and everything was to see how comfortable. So th that would be what I would think. First off would be, did a haptic slip out of the bag when you thought it was in the bag? And secondly, how short or how small is this eye? Um, and is there any abnormality here going on that the haptics are chafing the iris? And, and the other thing I just wanted to add is, you know, these, these IFAS cases with small pupil, these are, these are the ones that are, that are at high risk for placing at least one of the haptics in the sulcus. Yeah. People down at the end of the case, uh, you're just glad to get done with the case, and um, uh, and next thing you, you know, you don't you don't really uh, you, you don't really notice it. So um, I'm always thinking at the end of these small people cases, I'm always thinking a little bit more about double checking, both both looking for uh, placement of the haptics, but also looking for residual lens material, which is which the, these patients are also at higher risk for. Perfect. Absolutely. Thank you. So I absolutely agree with those points. I mean, this was a small pupil case, uh, an IFIS case, but this was not iatrogenic at the time of cataract surgery and it wasn't there before the cataract surgery. This, the, the transillumination developed uh, post-op. So, uh, I mean, if you look at it, there's, there's transillumination defects about 180 degrees apart, directly anterior to the, the haptics. I think if you look at the right of the screen, you can even make out the haptic there. Yeah. And like Rosa said, it's suggestive of iris shaping or UGG syndrome. And as the audience astutely picked out, it's from a malplaced one piece IOL, whether in the sulcus or bag sulcus position. Now, this is about as well as the patient dilates in the clinic, and I could not definitively see the anterior rexus. Uh, I did get a UBM, and this actually looked pretty good to me. Uh, it, sh it shows a well-placed IOL, there's a clear sulcus space, and the IOL was not in contact with the posterior iris. Um, so I actually ended up taking this patient back to the OR for surgical exploration. He dilated much better uh, with intracameral fennel, and again, if you look at the top of the screen there, uh, you can actually see the transillumination defects, again, directly anterior to, to the haptic. But I hope this proves to you that the IOL was definitively in the bag um, <laughs> when we went back. So here I am just sort of inflating the, 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 the eye and inflating the bag. And we'll go in with a um, blunt spatula and dissect off the, the anterior rexus from the lens. This is fairly recent post-op. I mean, um, I think the initial diagnosis was made at six weeks. It's probably about eight weeks post-op. Um, and the haptic came out uh, very nicely there. So we freed that one up. I apologize if the video is not centered here. Uh, Ike's probably cursing right now, but here we have the uh, trailing, 
<laughs> the trilling after coming out. And again, I, I'd like to prove to you that it was definitively in the bag um, when this case started. So now that I've got the lens into the anterior chamber, I like to use MST instruments to bisect this lens into halves. And so we'll, 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 let, just, we'll let that finish. Um, for, for anyone who hasn't done this, you gotta be very mindful of the corneal endothelium and the posterior capsule when uh, exchanging lenses. Um, and typically there is one half that is a little bit smaller than the other. So I take that one out, make some space in the eye. So we'll just take that one out here. And then what I like to do is you can, uh, you can certainly enlarge the wound, but often uh, just by placing the, the, the second piece in a uh, advantageous position and then using the curvature of the fragment, you can sort of pull it out uh, through your uh, original incision. And in this case, what I ended up doing was replacing that lens with a three piece lens. And I did end up placing this again in the bag. There was no reason not to, right? My anterior rexus was round centered of good integrity and the posterior capsule was intact. So I did replace this lens with a um, three piece lens in the bag and postoperatively his symptoms resolved and his eye is now quiet. So I don't know if the, uh, oh, actually I, I got some, so I actually went back and I got some history for you as well. So this is the, this is the patient's chart. Uh, and you can see I did his surgery about a year ago, but a year prior to that, he admitted to my staff that he's had a fair bit of trauma to the right eye and that he smokes about one and a half grams of weed a day. Oh. So what happened here? I mean, the eye exchange <laughs> went fine as did the original cataract surgery. And you saw there was no zonulopathy there, there, but I do suspect that there's probably some occult zonulopathy here. And there's some anterior posterior movement of the eye wall causing chafing. And when I asked, so when I asked him about, about all this, he said fair bit of trauma means 200 fist fights lifetime. And he probably actually smokes closer to three grams of weed a day. Um, and that's often how he gets in trouble. And he did actually provide me this selfie that he's given me permission to share with you guys today. Um, <laughs> now, I don't know if uh, the panelists have any comments on this case, but I, I thought it was a pretty cool case to encounter. I, I think not knowing the history that, that he just gave you, um, I think you did everything right in the first case. So you put the lens nicely in the bag. You had no idea of knowing that he had a, flap, a floppy bag and that this lens was gonna be moving behind the iris and the IOL exchange with a three piece IOL was perfectly done. So um, the only thing that I could suggest is something that Emmer Agarwal does is he pulls the single piece lens out of the bag and then implants another lens underneath to give a scaffold. So you don't have to so much worry now about the posterior capsule. Now you just worry about keeping it away from the cornea. So it's a scaffolding implanting when you are um, cutting the lens and you don't have to be as cognizant with your posterior capsule if you put your lens in first. I mean, that would be the only pearl I would give there. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. You know, I, this is Tom. Yeah, I've, I've never seen, um, this situation, some of the people on, on the uh, chat have mentioned this before, but I've never seen the situation where a single piece of acrylic, which is perfectly in the bag with, with one of the most perfect wrecks I've ever seen. I don't know if that's the reason you showed us the case to show off your wrecks. <laughs> I well, taught him everything he knows, Tom. Well, somebody, yeah, that's for sure. But, the, um, but I think the, uh, the interesting thing about it is, is it implies that just the simple extra thickness of those single piece um, haptics in the capsule could cause UG syndrome, which is really um, kind of startling. And the zonules weren't that weak. Um, so that, that's a really unusual case. Now, another possibility, just to, just to throw out another possibility, is that there was some residual lens material or something else causing the inflammation that you happen to get with the IA, and it has nothing to do with the lens. Um, I hate to, I mean, it could be that, those, that the uh, posterior uh, leaf pigment that we saw disrupted was related to the IFAS or something. Because this is, to me, this is such a, um, sort of paradigm busting case that I, I it's hard for me to believe it. Um, but uh, I don't know if other people think about that, but I've just never seen a, a lens so perfectly in place with zonules that were that good causing UG before. Uh, Amadou, did you see this with a small eye? I don't remember the excellence on this one. Was it a small eye? The UBM looks like it's a pretty deep AC, but. Not a small eye. So I, I actually hid that slide, I'm sorry. I only had an A scan on this patient preoperatively. He declined the IO master, but roughly a 23 and a half millimeter or 24 millimeter eye, I'm sorry, and a three and a half millimeter AC depth. Because I, I went back and looked to say, was this a shallow AC in an average eye or something? 
Um, there, there's nothing, so, even with the first case, it, it went perfectly fine. There's nothing in Rob that made me concerned. So a couple of things, I think Ed Zoling just mentioned something about sleep. And I think I was going to mention that, you know, these vigorous eye rubbers, you know, mm -hmm. uh, they can exert a lot of pressure on the bag and on the anterior chamber. And, and of course, if the indent, if you indent the iris and the AC, you're particularly going to hit the, those haptics. And that could be one mechanism. And the Zonus look too good to me, though. I agree with Tom. And the Zonus is too good to me for that lens to be moving unless they had postoperative shallowing, like I think Ian Connor mentioned malignant glaucoma or Alan Carlson said posterior capsule distension, which could push the lens forward temporarily, myopic shift, and then they go back to where they normally are. Um, th those TI defects are, are a lot for only six weeks, right? Usually we see TI defects, it, it takes a while to get that much of iris loss, although if it's really bad, sometimes you see it. And then other clue on this one is, Usually with an UX syndrome from a haptic in the sulcus, the TI defects line the haptic pretty closely. But these were really broad, right? They were broad. Yeah, they were like, you know, not just over the haptic. They were like all the way to the pupil almost on both sides. So it implies that maybe there's some actually like, you know, the eye rubbing phenomena or something shallowing temporarily, although I expect you to have seen that, is probably what it is. And now you've got, you got the single, you got the three-piece haptics in now. And so he may still be rubbing his eye, but maybe not to the same uh, issue as far as having those thinner haptics. That that would be, I think, my plausible theory. Okay, I mean, all great thoughts. I mean, I um, I didn't ask him about eye rubbing, so I, I I actually have an upcoming appointment with him because his second eye hasn't been done yet, and I was going to ask the 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 group here. I mean, any any value in a CTR um, in advance, and what would you go with a one piece or three piece for the second eye here? Well, don't ask him if he rubs his eye. Ask him how much he rubs his eye. Fair enough, yeah. That way he can't deny it. <laughs> I, I, a capsule, somebody mentioned in the chat a capsule tension ring. Maybe that would help. I don't know. I'd probably just go with a three-piece eye well, just to be safe and match it to his first eye. Yeah. All right, well, I'll keep you guys posted on that one. Here's, an, here's another interesting case. So similar story. Persistent post-op iritis, uh, flares with steroid taper. This is a red eye in contrast to the previous eye. And he had surgery six months ago um, elsewhere. Um, and it just presented to me through the eMERGE clinic with a red eye. And if you look at the bottom of the, and, and he's had multiple post-op exams, but if you look at the bottom of the screen, there's, there's actually a retained lens fragment. Uh, so mm. I wanna show you, the, I wanna show you the video this is actually one of our star PGY5 residents, Angela Zank, who did this case. Uh, I think she did a great job of it. Um, she's quickly going to bring this into view for you. And what you'll see is that there's a retained lens fragment. Um, and one of the pearls that we learned here, uh, Angela and I both, was that we probably should have compartmentalized this fragment uh, earlier than we did. But instead, we injected the Lido and the Myocol. And you can see that the, the, uh, with the flow that the retained lens fragment is moving quite a bit. And here comes the myocall. And this is exactly what you don't want to see is the, the fragment uh -huh. uh, begin to migrate posteriorly. But luckily, the myocall kicked in just in time and kept it in the AC. But that was just the beginning of the fun with this case. So what we did do is we compartmentalized the, the, the lens fragment uh, using viscoelastic now. So we think we've got things under control. And we felt that uh, we didn't need to go back in with the FACO, but the plan was simply to go in with the irrigation aspiration and uh, eat up this retained fragment. Well, you'll notice that as soon as she goes into the eye here and grabs that piece, it starts to break apart. Look at that, right? Like she, all she got was a tiny nugget of it and the rest of it was still there. And we're, we're, what's going on? Well, what's going on is that this fragment was actually, and we, could, we tried, but the, the other center would not communicate with us very well. I couldn't get the original OR note, but what happened with this patient is the retained fragment, um, or so the original case, I'm sorry, was a femtosecond assisted cataract surgery, and they used a waffle pattern for the nuclear disassembly or nuclear softening. And I, and I don't know how well it projects, I hope you can see it, but there's little squares um, of the waffle pattern in this, and that's why it continues to break apart. Now we've lost a bit there, uh, to, into the uh, pupillary space. And she did go back in and she actually retrieved some of it. And then we know that we've got some of the side port here. So we'll take care of that while it's still in our view. 
And now we know we've got retained fragment behind the pupil. It's gone transpupillary uh, into the sulcus. And what we decided to do is purposely shallow this eye out uh, and hope that it might come forward. So we actually, we went digging first, didn't, didn't go very far, uh, but just allowed the AC to shallow and the piece came right back there out. Um, mm -hmm. So again, we go back in with the viscoelastic and compartmentalize. And you'll see that here. And the reason I thought this case was cool is I've had a few cases of retained lens fragment, but never have I seen it with the waffle pattern. And this did present us unique challenges just with every time we try to uh, IA this piece, it would, it, it would um, fire off some small nuggets or small pieces. And that made the case a little bit more difficult than it should have been. You can see right there, it's sort of like that Tetris piece pattern. And so mm -hmm. she, she's using the chopper as much as she needs to, but as little as she can uh, to sort of feed it in. And the rest of the case went very well. We did actually dilate the eye. Uh, I know we've, we've already put in myocol, we put pilocarpine originally, but we did actually put some intracameral phenylephrine in because we wanted to see if there's anything else behind the, uh, behind the pupil. We did actually get some reasonable dilation as you'll see here in a second. Uh, we weren't sure how much we were gonna get given all the pharmacological meiosis that we've already induced, but we actually got some reasonable dilation and we were able to uh, be sure that we had left nothing behind. And this patient has done quite well post-operatively. So we'll stop that one there and um, open it up to the panel. And any tips you have as well for just general retained lens fragment cases? So I think I've been seeing some of the comments coming up and things that I've been thinking. I probably would have split the IA here and done by manual IA if I was gonna go in with the IA tip, like a banana split, still using the main um, IA to, to keep it the wound tight but using my irrigation through a side port. Um, and, and that way you might've had more control over the tip because you wouldn't have been pushing it away. Just like when you do a vitrectomy, you don't want the fluid hydrating and, and pushing it away. I think compartmentalizing with a dispersive viscoelastic versus a cohesive, and I don't know what you were using there, but I would have used a heavier viscoelastic, a dispersive viscoelastic to compartmentalize it. Um, definitely dilating the pupil is important to make sure that there aren't any other pieces left behind. Um, as well as in this case, the piece was big enough. I mean, did, did you think of going in with a phaco tip and just getting it all at once? That's the only other comment I would have. Uh, th this is Tom. I, I, there's a couple of things I want to comment on. Num number one is um, I do like the idea of not dilating and using a dispersive viscoelastic to move the piece right across from your main incision and just have it stay there. And then what, what I do, which may sound crazy, is I take a malugan ring, I, I, I throw away the malugan ring with a flare off to the side and just use the insert. <laughs> and then, then you go in with the malugan ring insert, and then you, you put the steel plate mm. on the retained piece of material and then you go in there and then the, the little malugan ring grabber you use that to grab the piece and you pull it inside the the cartridge of the malugan ring inserter and then you can take wow. one piece and the most important thing about that is it requires uh, no irrigation within the chamber and so therefore you don't lose the piece because it's so frustrating to go in and have that piece go underneath your um your pupil edge so it's worth a hundred bucks or whatever malugan ring costs uh especially at the VA where we just print more money, it's no big deal. And so I, that's the first thing I'd recommend. The second thing is if you choose to use um, either FACO or if you choose to use the IA, what I would do is, is either do by manual, as Rosa said, and not use irrigation at first or pinch off the um, irrigation portion of the device so that you can go in under viscoelastic alone and you can, you can slowly FACO it in just with viscoelastic holding the chamber. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about the sudden sort of craziness of the, um, of the fluid in the chamber. Mm -hmm. So that's the ways that I typically do it. Uh, if it's bigger than the Malugan ring, I'll use a FACO with, uh, with dry aspiration, with no, with no, um, no uh, irrigation fluid, just dry with uh, viscoelastic. Um, and I use dispersive. And then the other thing I, I just, this is a great time to emphasize the the prophylaxis of this. And, and one of the things that I've learned over the years to do is at the end of the case um, to introduce an eddy current into your chamber. So, so go through the paracentesis, squirt fluid with your cannula through the paracentesis. And what that will do is that'll introduce new currents inside the chamber 
which often will show you that there was a little piece of material there. Sometimes it's under the phaco needle, sometimes it's under the iris, sometimes it's in the paracentesis. But I do that every single case, and it is shocking how many times there are little pieces of material that I didn't know about. And I, th I think um, that, um, that it's probably more common than we think, and it's probably um, uh, oftentimes not ever detected. And they just kind of go, but I, I, uh, I, I, would, I would try to prevent it, and I would uh, think about that Malugan wing inserter uh, trick. It really does work well. That's a great tip, Tom. And I think, I mean, I picked that up from you at the cataract course. So thank you for that. And I've often seen uh, when you're hydrating the wounds at the end, that that eddy sort of gets the, the flow going and then you get uh, a fragment. It's nothing more frustrating than that when you have to go back in. So I've started doing that much earlier. So thank you. Uh, I, I quickly want to show you guys one last case. This is a fast one. Uh, pr something that I thought that was really cool. This is a patient very, really early in my practice within the first year presents with count finger and hand motion cataract, really dense, hyper mature, hyper brunescent cataract, no view to the back uh, because of the cataract. Uh, we did try to get an IOL master and we couldn't, it simply could not penetrate. And these are just nuclear sclerotic cataracts. And we did get an axial length uh, via the A scan of 31 millimeters. And so um, the, the formulas are calling for about a minus five diopter IOL. And we did get a B scan, which showed a retinal detachment in the back. So I thought to myself, well, okay, I can wash my hands of this one, right? This is not my problem anymore. Uh, send it off to retina for combined phaco bit. But lo and behold, they sent it right back. And they said, you know what? It's a chronic RD. And there's actually an RD in the other eye as well. Uh, so there's chronic RDs in both eyes. And why don't you do the phaco first? And we'll come back later and uh, mm -hmm. do a secondary vitrectomy, given how dense this cataract is and how chronic the RD is. All right. So... And this is the case. So what I, what I generally do with the Vision Blue is I inject it via the side port uh, and then wash it out with BSS. And that's what you're going to see here uh, in just a minute. So I've injected the Vision Blue to stain the anterior capsule. And here we go. Wash it out. And boom, there's a huge egress of Vision Blue from the sulcus space. And again, and I kind of know in the back of my mind what, what's going to happen here, but I also need to finish this case because he's got a hyper mature cataract and a retinal detachment at the back and the retina surgeon needs to do his job. So here, here we go with the Rexus. It's sped up a little bit, uh, slightly larger than normal, just given how dense this case is. And what I want to show you here is the FACO uh, went fine. And with the vision blue, the Rexus went fine. But as I'm doing my FACO, I start to realize I don't have a red reflex. In fact, I've got a blue reflex. And so what happened um, earlier on when you're seeing that egress is due to a combination of maybe how hyper mature this cataract is, maybe some zonulopathy, as well as the axial myopia, there was trans um, zonular passage of the vision blue and it stained the posterior capsule. And so although the phaco went fine, the rest of the case is incredibly difficult. Um, the, uh, getting, getting that cortex was tough, it's sort of by feel. The, the view at the microscope was not much better than what you're seeing here, uh, but you can kind of see some frills of the anterior, uh, uh, sorry, of the cortex and you can grab it. Um, but actually once this is done, the case gets even harder because now you've got a clean blue anterior capsule and a clean blue posterior capsule. And it's quite deep because this is a 31 millimeter eye, remember. So um, injecting the IOL was a little bit uh, hairy, but I, we did manage to do it uh, as you'll see here. So three piece IOL, just because of the um, IOL power being about a minus four or minus five. Um, and this did actually end up going okay, but it was kind of scary. And I guess the lesson for me here was um, that maybe don't inject the vision blue uh, through the side port. I, I know Ike and Rosa have both talked to me about this in the past. Uh, <laughs> if, if, you have, if you have any sort of zonular weakness or zonular defects, th this is a real risk. And I have long, uh, respected them, but I still managed to inject the vision booth to the side for it. And here's a home video of Rosa. So this is her telling me what to do and clearly it didn't pay off, but um, I I'll didn't hear what there. I said. I don't even remember. Oh, it, it just says blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's it. That's it. I guess I'll uh, wrap it up there for my cases and I'm going to stop the screen share. I haven't seen much of the comments. So I'll go back to that, but I don't know if the panel has any thoughts on that one. Uh, I think Tom, do I go first? 
Uh, yeah, maybe maybe quickly, Rosa, because we want to move ahead. But yeah, thanks. Share share your thoughts on that case, Rosa. So I do my vision blue very differently. I don't know about you or Tom, but I always put viscoelastic in and then paint the capsule with as little vision blue as necessary. So I could in fact use a whole vision blue vial for an entire day if I did 10 cases, because I used less than 0.1 cc's when I use my vision blue. I like to control it that way. And so I'll paint the capsule underneath of the OVD and then, and then you don't even have that much there. You inject a little bit more OVD because I haven't overfilled the eye with the OVD. And I like to go through my main wound when I paint because then it gives you a little bit more torque. And that's the only thing I would have done. I guess you missed those days with me in the OR when you were around. Oh, I, d I definitely knew, but I think sometimes you got to make a mistake <laughs> once and then you learn your lesson, right? Like you and I could both told me this, but it still didn't mean I had to listen. No. <laughs> Well, I want, I want to thank you, Amadi, for uh, some really thought-provoking cases, some controversies, and you generated a really good discussion. Uh, Rosa and Tom, so amazing to have you be here to share your thoughts. Uh, you know, dedication education is amazing to hear everybody here. So thanks so much. And the, and the attendees, you guys had a lot of great points to, to raise thank up you. here. I know we couldn't address all of them. And maybe, Amadi, if you're, you're welcome to go back and answer some of them if you wish. But I want to move ahead here because we have another talk, of course, and that's on glaucoma. Uh, we're going to ask Devinder Grover to prepare our slides. And Devinder, thank you so much for being here. I want to say hi to all the Devinder Grover fan club members that are here as well. Um, we have uh, over 600 people uh, between both platforms here that have heard the previous talk and are looking forward to your talk as well. Uh, and to, sorry to disappoint those that are here to hear about GAT, but I know that you're going to speak about other things as well because you have expertise in so many areas. So thank you for being here, Devinder. You've been a, a real you know, force in glaucoma, and we appreciate you being here. Uh, we have two other forces with you as well here today, and that's uh, Leon Herndon from Duke. Uh, Leon, uh, you know, thank you so much for being here. You run the glaucoma service. You've been a stalwart in glaucoma in our field at AGS and ASCRS as well. And so appreciate and look forward to your comments as well. And Annalisa, uh, we appreciate you being here as well. Uh, I've operated with you before. I know how passionate you are about what you do, what you believe in. I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on Devinder's presentation as well. Of course, we always we welcome our, our cataract colleagues to remain here as well. Uh, and contribute to that discussion as well. I know Tom's gonna have some difficult questions to ask you, so be ready for that, Devinder. So thank you for being here. All right, there, unmuted. Thank you, Ike. Um, and I appreciate you know both Jeb and Ike for making this happen. There may be a few members of the Devinder fan club, but there are, you know, we're all members of the Ike fan club. So we really appreciate you for doing this, Ike, and uh, and this is exciting. And again, Annalisa and Leon, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to talk just on some, yeah, not GATS, it's going to be a surprise, uh, just on some traps and tubes and little tricks we've been playing, playing with. Uh, these are my financial disclosures, none of which are really pertinent to the discussion today. Um, the learning objectives are just kind of talk about some approaches to blood revisions, uh, appreciate the problems associated with treating hypotony associated with, uh, with tubes, and, and also the challenges that we can experience with, uh, with complex tube erosion and repairs. So I'm kind of, you know, I've been in practice almost 10 years now and, and just kind of want to have this as a summary of kind of my adventures in glaucoma over the past decade. I'm probably going to only get to maybe a couple. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. So we'll see how this goes. So I want to definitely uh, take advantage of the expertise we have uh, with Annalisa and Leon and, and, and Ike and the whole crew um, on, on some of this stuff. So, you know, the overlying theme and, and Leon, I'm glad you're here because, you know, whenever I think of Duke, I always think of David Epstein and... Uh, he came to visit um, our residency program at, at, at Hopkins when I was a resident, and I still remember a lot of his teaching pearls. And one of the things he said was that, uh, you know, think of your clinic as your own laboratory. And uh, I wish I had more time to, uh, to learn and interact with David Epstein. He was such a force in the field and such a great teacher. Uh, but I think about that almost every day I'm in my clinic and, and our patients are our best teachers. And if you're not learning from your patients, you're not, you're not paying attention. So here's an example. Here's a gentleman, a uh, young uh, man of European descent on max meds, long-standing history of glaucoma, uh, presents in, this is 2012 again, so when you think about these cases, think about when they're presenting because it can uh, impact our decision-making process. So he has unilateral glaucoma or asymmetric glaucoma actually, more advanced on the left side with uncontrolled pressures. And um, he's, you know, he's got a case spindle, dense pigment, pretty classic uh, pigmentary glaucoma. You can see a uh, significant neurofibrillary loss on the left side. He's not the best visual field taker, but you're gonna see why, because you can see on the left side, his optic nerve is, is quite advanced um, 
and has glaucomatous changes. So, you know, uh, when you see these kind of patients, then again, switch your mind back to 2012. Um, so what are our options? You know, uh, you could, could start meds, SLT, maybe you could do some ginkgo, um, but you can do traps and tubes and, and all that stuff. So let's just see what the audience would consider doing in this situation. You have a, Jeb, do I control the audience or do you do that? I got it. Okay. I can't do anything. I'm, I'm... So the vendor is the question: 2012 or present day? Yes, 2012. You're in. You're in my in my shoes. I've been in practice for two years, and um, and what would you do in 2012? 2012, I'm gonna do a trap most likely. But then, now I would go for a mix. What about you, Leah? Yeah, 2012, definitely a trabeculectomy was, um, you know, was the way we went. But now with more pigmented angles, I think an unroofing procedure, a GAT, uh, perhaps is where I might consider. Yeah. Although your work, Devender, has shown that those of more severe disease mean defect worse than 15, I believe. Yes. Didn't do as well. Yeah, and that's true specifically in, in you know, in healthcare systems where eyes have been abused by drops for 20 years, like this guy, uh, as opposed to, I think, in, in other countries where patients aren't on drops for a significant period of time. But I would still give it a try. I mean, he's fairly young and being active with a drop. Yeah. This day and age, it would limit you. Yeah, I agree. I would uh, not do a drop in my eye if I didn't necessarily need it. I. I feel the same way, Annalisa. Um, yeah, so the, the audience is thinking of TRAB and, um, you know, um, we did our first GAT in October 2011. So this this was probably six months after our first GAT, but we we uh, we did the same thing. I did a TRAB uh, in him and uh, I was still using sponges at the time and he did really well uh, in 2012. And then in 15, he, he's, I'm following him and uh, his cataract is slowly getting a little bit worse. Um, I was nice enough to give him a cataract over the last couple of years. And, um, and, and so then he wanted, um, you know, his pressure was controlled on latanoprost. And so I went in and just an uncomplicated, straightforward um, cataract. I did pre-operatively uh, treat him with some, uh, or post-operatively treat him with some Diamox and Timolol just to pretend, prevent any potential spike, um, which I ended up getting on the first day. His pressure was 30. I massaged him down and got a little bit of a blab. Um, but essentially, over the last couple, next couple of weeks, I really just kind of lost my lost my blood. So here we have a guy who's one month out, uh, and uh, good vision, pressure's high on everything. I can't get his blood to to pop back open, and um, and so now the the question is, what do you, what would you do now? Would you would you needle him at the slit lamp? Would you take him back to the operating room? Would you do another trab or tube? Um, would you consider uh, something else? Leon, what would you do? Well, I would go back to Vendor and ask what type of assessment did you do uh, to the bleb before the FACO? Uh, did you have any idea of maybe modifying the bleb? Uh, the pressure was 15 on the medication. Yeah, uh -huh. he had a nice he had a nice low bleb. It was it was really one of those ones where I was very you know very happy with. He had a nice morphology and 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 I was I was shocked to lose control of it the way it did. Yeah, one thing I've done in the OR when I go back to do the FACO, I'll use Tripan Blue. If you get an immediate blue bleb, uh, then you, you feel really confident that you can leave the bleb alone. But if there's no, just only a small trickle of uh, Tripan into the bleb, I probably would consider doing the abinternal uh, revision at the same time as the FACO. Yeah. I think that another factor is that when you do, you have a nice bleb and you do a FACO, you are creating some inflammation and cytokines. So I tend to keep them on longer spread uh, and I tend to needle them sooner yeah. you know, just yeah. to try to get that flow going again. Sometimes even in these kind of patients, I'll, I'll do a subtenons cantalog injection. Uh, Indeed, that's, just that's really what I do. Control the eye. So it looks like the whole crowd is thinking needling of some sort, either in the operating room or the slit lamp. And, um, and it's cases like this that actually came, brought, brought us to develop something here, maybe my partner Ron Feldman this ab internal bleb revision spatula, uh, which I want to talk about. Uh, I was initially doing it with the psychodialysis spatula, but I found it was too short and too kind of uh, pointy, and it was more likely to perforate through the conjunctiva. So uh, we designed an instrument that's about 18 millimeters long and curved, and you can see that it's a more of a blunted, uh, blunted tip. 
uh, that is sharp on the sides, but kind of blunter on the, on the tip that is less likely to perforate. And what we do is we reach across, we make it a paracentesis inferiorly, we reach across, you get through the sclerotomy site, and then, the, and this was not by design on my intention at all, just dumb luck, but maybe wisdom by the instrument guy that helps me with this, Mateen. I mean, uh, the blue com coloring of the, of the spatula helps you really see it nice and easily. And you can really just selectively unroof the posterior aspect of, that, uh, of the flap and you get this nice low diffuse blab. And so I use this in patients that have a scarred flap blab or they have a tenon cyst that I can't needle at the slit lamp uh, or I wanna avoid doing a tube or in these situations where you, know, you have a beautiful blab and then it fails either immediately or, or long-term after FACO. Um, what's interesting is you think about the, you know, I remember the very first time I saw blood needling at the slit lamp when I was a medical student. I thought it was one of the most barbaric things I've ever seen in my entire life. And maybe that's why I went in this field to, to hope that I could never have to do a trap in a patient again. Um, but what's interesting about this technique is when you go underneath the flap, any, anybody that's ever done a, a blood revision, that fibrotic tissue is most of the time, it's mostly avascular. So you're less, you're less likely to actually get a bleed when you go ab interno and unroof the flap posteriorly as opposed to going through the conge at the slit lamp and you, you're going through vascular tissue and you're more likely to, uh, to get some bleeding. So, you know, I usually will give them mito um, on the table before, you know, when we started doing this back in 2012 and 13, before we were very comfortable with mito, I'd actually inject it in the clinic. Uh, a week before the surgery. Now we're becoming more and more comfortable uh, with injecting mito. Um, and uh, so now I'm doing it just right before, uh, before the surgery. And here's a, a video of, of that. Um, this is uh, a different patient, but you can see he has a, a pretty much a scarred blab. This is the a, a left eye. This is the iridectomy. I'm making a paracentesis inferiorly. In this situation, I'm doing a paracentesis to to rotate the globe down. I've actually, uh, I go back and forth between this and a traction suture, uh, but you really need to be able to rotate the globe down far. And again, this curved nature prevents, um, makes it really less likely that you're gonna perforate through the conjunctiva. Um, actually now really like Ike's um, gonio prism as opposed to this gonio prism because the view is so much better. So thank you Ike for the many things you've contributed. Um, I use your gonio prism almost on a weekly basis, or I used to. Um, you want to get in and, and get through that, that sclerotomy site. Make sure you're in there before you get off, and then stay there, and then come off and then rotate the globe down. If you don't, you can inadvertently create an iridodialysis or cyclodialysis. What's also interesting is understanding the blood morphology when you're doing this technique. There's actually almost two layers of scar tissue that you'll feel yourself going through. The first layer is getting through the flap, and there's almost always a couple millimeters more per another kind of ring of steel that you have to go to. But I'm just selectively unroofing the posterior component of it, and you can and and you get pretty aggressive with it uh, because you want to um, get a nice you want to get as posterior as possible. And that's what's nice about the spatula is that it's long enough to really reach back there. You can see how far back into the fornix I'm getting to get um, to get that. And I really want to unroof it. You are going to get immediate hypotony. You're making almost an un unguarded filter. So I leave helon in the eye. And anytime I do any of this stuff, I want to maintain my wounds. Even though they're paracentesis wounds, I still will err on, on putting a suture through it. I'm washing out all my helon, which I think is doing one of two things. One, it's letting me know how much helon's in the eye. Two, I think it's pushing helon into the subconjunctival space, which may in itself have an anti-fibrotic component. And then I will selectively put in a certain amount, a known amount of helon to give the patient Kenalog as well as atropine uh, because they will have um, a relatively low pressure. But these are patients that have already demonstrated that they have the ability to form scar tissue. And these are the kind of blebs we're seeing. I mean, these are the blebs we all dream about, that low diffuse posterior bleb, just because we're getting that selective unroofing of the posterior flap. Um, and this gentleman did, did, did quite well. And, um, and even, um, even nine months out, you can just see, this is one from the paper we published on it, but, uh, but a nice view. But this is what he looked like nine months out. He has this nice diffuse pleb um, and, um, and really well-controlled pressure. Um, and, and we published this a couple of years back. And again, these are patients that already have demonstrated they have the ability to form scar tissue. And I've done this in traps that I've done. I've done this in traps that I haven't done. The mean age of the bleb in this patient was almost seven, in, these, in this series was almost seven years. 
but we took patients with pressures in the 20s and on almost four meds down to 12 on 0.8. And there are tons of papers on blood revisions. And it's, you know, this is just a small retrospective series. But what's powerful about this is that in this patient population that have already demonstrated that they have this ability to form scar tissue, uh, 16 of these eyes did not need further surgical intervention, did not need another a tube or anything like that. I mean, four of them did, and probably five of them, the one that was lost to follow-up, would have needed a tube. Uh, but we've saved um, 15 of these eyes, or 16 of these eyes from needing further incisional surgery, uh, which I think is very powerful. Um, like I said, I leave helon in the eye, put atropine on the eye, and very aggressive on treating inflammation. And, um, and, and put them on precautions because they will have a relatively low pressure for that first week, but they will eventually scar um, down to the point where the pressure is not gonna be too, too low. I, I've really um, not seen a significant problem with uh, long-term hypotony. You may have it for the first week or two, but they pretty, pretty much will scar down. And this is not a, a super new technique. I mean, this is a blast from the task from our, the great thinkers of the field and Dick Simmons initially described a similar um, approach to this back in the 90s um, where he actually what he did was he used the psychodialysis spatula he made a paracentesis right at the ostomy site or right kind of mid cornea which kind of freaks me out a little bit I don't know if I would do that um, and then he would put the psychodialysis spatula through the ostomy and do that and Paul Palmberg also does some needling at the slit lamp uh, where he goes um, trans conjunctival flap with the needle. Uh, they did not usually use mitomycin C injecting to augment this procedure, but I think this is a more controlled and, um, and, and more predictable way of, of treating these patients and getting far posterior, not just unroofing the flap, but getting that second ring of scar tissue to allow for that far posterior blood. Uh, so that's the that's the first first case. So there have been uh, a couple of questions, and maybe we'll get Leon and Annalisa to speak. But just a couple of questions people are asking: Would you do this uh, in a fake patient? Um, what's the name of the instrument, and who makes it? Yeah, um, it, it's it's called the. I mean, you know, we have to name things after ourselves, right? Uh, it's just the sclerot sclerotomy spatula. It's the Grover Feldman sclerostomy spatula. It's made by Epsilon, and I have his contact information. I have no financial interest in that at all. But at the end of the slide deck, I have his email and contact information for people that want it. Um, and take it, guys. You're, you're okay. You're yeah, okay with I think guys. you know. I think at this point, you know, if a patient's already had a trab, you're going back into the eye. They're probably going to have some level of cataract. Um, if you if you don't um, if if they don't have a cataract after this and more anterior chamber manipulation, you're probably going to give them one. Um, but uh, but I, I think if you're careful and not going to hit the lens. Uh, I think it'd be perfectly fine to do any blood revision in a fake patient. So Leon, I'm curious on your on your thought process. Uh, are you would you be more of a needler at the slit lamp, or are you more of an OR guy to do revisions? What's what's your kind of thought process? Because very elegant, very elegant technique that the uh, Devinder's described here. Yeah, I, I'm not a big needler at the slit lamp unless the bleb is elevated. One thing that's nice, Devinder, that you showed me is that you can rescue a flat bleb. I always tell my trainees that the bleb is flat, go somewhere else, go to a different quadrant. But with your technique, you're able to rescue flat blebs. A uh, couple pointers, I have used a psychodialysis spatula. I haven't used your spatula yet, like, yeah, but you're right. The psychodialysis spatula is a little too sharp. Now, I have uh, perforated posteriorly so uh, <laughs> that sharp uh, psychodialysis <laughs> spatula. And also, if you do your trials and express joints, obviously, you can't do this. So, yeah, so keep that in mind. I, we described a way of doing an ab internal. And this is actually all a modification of how I think I came about this was initially, I described a, a technique of an ab internal express joint removal where I would deliver right. the expression in the anterior chamber. And right. then I went in with my micro uh, surgical scissors and would bluntly dissect to create an ostomy. And I think that was what led me to then in another patient attempt something like this with the psychodialysis spatula. And then it was too short. I was having problems with perforating the conge. And then that's what led to this. So I think you can, with some motivation, do this in a patient, but you'd have to take out the express. Well, I have to say that I, you may have your fans, but once I started using the spatula, which to the difference of a cyclodialysis, it has a bend on it. And that bend makes it very easy to, instead of a straight cyclodialysis, this has a very nice bend to it. I order my case as FACO Davinder revision. <laughs> and that's how my technicians already schedule them. So I am a big fan. I've been using it for three years since the last, I, I actually, that's how I met you, I think. 
with oh, wow. Sam in 2017, and then I started using your spatula, and it's changed a lot of my failed labs. So it, it is a good trick. And I don't think some people were talking about an MBR. I like the fact that this is not going to cut it. I feel like you push a little against that ring of fire, and sometimes you poke a few holes in the ring of fire, and then you kind of connect them. But, but I like the fact that I'm not cutting. Yeah, I think I think an MVR is very dangerous, and these like Leon you know, was saying, these flat blabs where the conge is weak, you need to be able to bluntly get back there. And what I like about the spatula is the tip is blunt, but the sides are a little sharp. So once you get through, you can use the sides to your advantage, but you still can lead with the blunt edge. And I think an important factor for people that are starting, if you have a very avascular blab, once you do it, don't do that whole blow in the viscoelastic out because that thin avascular blab, even though you protected it with the spatula, will pop. And ask me how I know that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, you know, this is my new coffee routine when I'm not in clinic. Um, you know, we call this uh, COVID coffee and uh, was my morning routine kind of changed a little bit. Uh, some people are changing this even more, calling it quarantine coffee. It's kind of like normal coffee, but it has a margarita in it and <laughs> no coffee. Uh, but uh, anyway, let's, uh, let's move on and talk about uh, some complex tube erosion. So I'll start with the case and uh, because again, our patients will make us better and they challenge us to do better. Um, quoting David Epstein, it's a lady, 63-year-old, history of diabetes, so we know it's a risk factor for tuberosions. She has ice syndrome, multiple prior surgeries, PK, uh, tube shunt, trabeculectomy, and cataracts, and she comes in with an erosion. Uh, she's on uh, a fixed combination medication and FML for the PK. Her right eye, as you'd expect, is completely normal. She's light perception. Her pressure is reasonable, but she's extensively scarred conjunctiva. Uh, you see the asymmetric nature of this disease as well. And, um, and this is what she looks like. And, you know, our patients have to look good. This is actually mascara, you know, despite the fact that she has a tube erosion, she's gotta, she's gotta have mascara. Uh, but you can see she just has this old trab. I did not put this tube in, um, my disclaimer, and I don't have a fellow to blame. So, um, you know, um, but, uh, but there's this really extensively scarred conch all over here. And uh, really you can't move it. And I'll show you a video of that later. But uh, you know, what are the options for repair? We can you know, do an, a, direct, a direct closure. You can do a conj autograft where you just remove conj from somewhere else and bring it over. You can try to just cover it up with some pericardium and, and sclera and, and hope that it epithelializes over. You could just remove it or reposition it and, or just take it out entirely and put it to a diode or CPC. But what I wanna talk about, use this as an opportunity to talk about uh, skin flaps. Because I think one of the biggest components when it comes to uh, tube erosions is, is vascularity and healthy vascular supply. In other fields of, of surgery, skin flaps are used all the time uh, to provide areas with inadequate vasculature with adequate vasculature from another part of, of the body. And uh, you need to understand the, the design of this, these flaps because the base needs to be able to support the length of it. Usually the general thinking in general surgery is about a ratio of three to one, uh, three length to one base uh, to make sure you have enough distal vascular supply. But there are other terms I wanna introduce. Uh, one is interpolated, which means that the, the base of the flap is not immediately adjacent um, to where you're going and you actually are going over healthy tissue. And then the pedicle flap means you're really moving skin or, or tissue from one area to another while maintaining it, your, your base. And we, you know, we, do, we do Gunderson flaps and, and uh, Hughes flaps, but, but we don't really do a lot of, of conjunctival flaps when it comes to glaucoma. And uh, I'm gonna introduce uh, something we've developed here a while back. And it's just a, it's a fornix based conjunctival pedicle flap. And this is an artist we hired to help um, highlight this case. But I do this in conjunction with an oculoplastic specialist where you double evert the lid, you access the fornicial conge, you maintain the base and then you rotate it over and, and are incorporating healthy tissue, healthy vascularized tissue to a, almost a desert. Uh, and this is, ends up being like an oasis of, of healthy vessels. So let's talk, let's show this video. And this, uh, Jim Merritt is one of the oculoplastic surgeons in, in, in Dallas and is just phenomenal. Uh, so here's that lady and uh, you can see um, basically um, just extensively scarred conge all at the limbus. You have some mobile mobility down uh, posteriorly, uh, but I'm gonna move away her mascara 
and I'm going to kind of advance a little bit. I'm basically creating a pocket of, you know, you need to epithelium and destroy all the epithelium around that area. So you do some dissection. I'm creating a pocket, but if you don't destroy the epithelium, you're not going to be able to repair this. And in retrospect, what I would have rather have done is actually pull out the tube and redirect it more posterior. Uh, I don't know why I didn't do that here, but this was, you know, my, again, two years into practice and I was still like, uh, we young lad. Uh, but I think that's a key thing to do is to take it out and make a longer tunnel and redirect it. Uh, here I'm just using partial thickness cornea and um, and suturing it uh, securely. Uh, but again, one of the key things is to using cautery to destroy all the epithelium around the tissue. If you haven't done that, you're not going to get adequate adequate closure. And then once I do that, and I created my patch and created my little pocket, then I pass it over to my uh, oculoplastics colleague, and he does things the eye never thought were possible, pass a nylon suture through the tarsus and double revert the lids. Um, and, um, and he helped develop this technique um, along with my other partners. And what he's doing here after he's doing the outline, and this is epi with Lido to help with some hemostasis. But he's so good at uh, creating this measurement of a three to one ratio, but he's really accessing that, that, that just that dense, healthy, vascularized fornicial conjunctiva. Um, you don't want any tension on here. You want the flap to be very loose and lax. You get a little bit of, um, a little bit of tenons with it as well. Um, and, and he's so good. He always just will be ha happy to come with us to the OR. I would recommend having an oculoplastic specialist with you. So then he isolated this flap. You can see there's no tension on it at all. Um, and, um, and then I'm going to reapproximate it. And you can see even right here, this is not a symblephron. It's not going to be a symblephron. It's healthy tissue going over healthy tissue to a different area. You can actually even sp pass a spatula uh, underneath there all the time. It doesn't scar down. You want to reapproximate it to this to this uh, site, and then uh, just secure it with some interrupted um, uh, vicro sutures. It doesn't need to be watertight. It's all going to be. It's healthy tissue that's going to epithelialize over, and. Um, and that fornix area doesn't scar down, doesn't cause motility restrictions at all. And this is what she looks like on the first day. Um, again, it's not. It looks like a symblephron. It's not a symblephron. It's very loose, and it doesn't cause mobility to, uh, restriction at all. And this is what she looks like one month later. Um, and you can just see. I, it's almost like this oasis of vascularity in this desert of of scarred and atrophic conjunctiva. And um, and then. You know, she's now four, actually five months out, five years out. I apologize. Um, her pressures are still controlled. No evidence of erosion at all. And anybody, you know, when you look at the, the data out there on tube erosion repair, the recurrence rate, depending on the series you look at, is probably around 40 to 50 percent. Uh, these are not uh, easy eyes to take care of. And this is what she looks like. It's her left eye. You can't tell that anything was done with the lid, uh, despite all the surgery she's had. There's no motility issues. And this is one of my favorite pictures, again, just showing you what we've done to help prevent the erosion, re recurrent erosion, is this is healthy. It's, like, it's just an oasis of healthy vasculature to a place that has no vessels at all. And that, I think, is a major risk factor that we don't appreciate for erosions. Um, and this is four years out, just this whole tissue. Again, you can still pass a little uh, cyclodialysis patch underneath here. There's no restriction in, um, in movements at all. Uh, and they do really well and they don't recur because you have healthy tissue. So the you know, that three to one ratio is so important, um, but it can be variable depending on a couple of factors. And we reported this back in 2013. And um, you know, 80% of these eyes had four or more intraocular procedures. All of them had you know, PKs, multiple trials, multiple tubes. The mean follow-up time at the time of this study it was almost 50 months. So, and we still, to, the, to date, um, are not seeing any recurrence in any of these erosions because we're bringing in very healthy tissue. Uh, so, you know, I think we're seeing a lot more, despite this MIGS revolution and everything that we're working on, we're seeing uh, more and more tubes being placed around the world because of cost-effective access to tubes with the Audi implant from, uh, from Aura Lab in India. And I think uh, we're gonna start to see more tube-associated complications. This is an erosion. And the more tubes we put in, the more complications we're gonna see. And I think this is huge. This is not for that patient that has healthy tissue and you can just kind of rotate it over. These are the patients that have very sick and scarred conjunctiva. Uh, those are the most challenging ones. And we've had such good experience with this, with this results. 
Um, I don't know if, if you guys ever played with this or um, what do you guys in your adventures with tube erosions? I haven't done any of those. Um, some people are asking if you have done them inferiorly. I think we, that's yeah, we, we've We've done it all. We've done them inferior. We've done them superior. We've actually been able to do some rotational ones from the inferior fornix to the superior temporal um, tube. And, um, and it all, amount, you know, when it, when it comes to that level, you need to be able to double evert the lid. And uh, we've actually, if you look at the paper, we have um, other cases where the lids are so tight, you can't get to the fornicial conge that our oculoplastic surgeon actually splits the lid um, and then gives us access to the fornix. We get the conge and then he repairs the lid and any self-respecting oculoplastic surgeon can repair an, uh, you know, a purposeful lid split. That's a bit of a word, Devinder. I was going to ask: um, Is this available just for monocular patients? Because I was sure that that will cause diplopia and strabismus issues. But uh, it looks like motility is still intact. No, because there's no tension on it. You yeah. really have so much ample conjunctiva, but there's no tension, so you're not seeing any. And we haven't seen in any of the cases we've done. We've been, like I said, um, my the practice started was doing this way before I came here. I was just so shocked when I when I came here and learned this technique. Um, but they've been doing it for now 20 years probably. And, um, and, and it's saved us on these tough, tough eyes. A lot of these patients are monocular, but we've done this in binocular patients. We're not seeing any motility issues at all. Nice work. It's nice. So um, going on the theme of, of, you know, the more experience we have with tubes, the more problems we're gonna see is this theme of, of tube associated hypotony. And um, so, you know, we're seeing more and more tubes being used. We know that as we age, our aqueous production is not 2.5 microliters per minute. It's variable, highly variable. And as we age, our aqueous production decreases. And we're seeing um, more and more patients that are coming in in their 80s uh, that had tubes in their 60s that had 350 bar belts that are now having tube-associated hypotony. And that's becoming a more and more common challenge. So here's an example of a 76-year-old uh, woman with an extensive past ocular history of a PK. All my patients have PKs, I guess, uh, you know, cataracts. Um, and she's on, um, on timolol, bromonidine, and, and latanoprost. Um, pressure is 23. Uh, she's 76 and um, has some decent cupping. And um, so I put a 350 in, 350 barbell. This was, again, a while back um, in 2014, I believe. Comes to me after, you know, after been following for five months. Her pressure's great. Her vision's 2060, which is kind of her baseline vision. Uh, the tube's in the sulcus, given her PK. She looks great. She's on Timolol once a day and steroid three times a day. So I send her back to her ophthalmologist, her primary ophthalmologist. She comes to see me two years later, and uh, her vision's down. She has a little edema of the cornea of the transplant. Uh, pressure's 10. I uh, increase the steroid to three times a day, and then her husband passes away, and I lose her for another couple of years. Um, and then she comes back and sees me in 2018. Her vision's down again, 2080 now. Uh, pressure's four. She's on steroid three times a day. Well, cornea is clear. Um, she has a little vitreo macular traction and some macular mild thickening of the macula. Um, her vision is down a little bit, but I don't. I, I think there's a component to uh, to uh, her uh, hypotony uh, related to all this stuff. And so, you know, what are the options we can do? We have this, you know, woman in, in her late 70s, early 80s now um, that has tube-associated hypotony. You remove the tube, you replace it with a smaller tube, you trim the plate, or are there some ab internal options? Uh, or you do nothing, um, which is always a, you know, a safe option. Send her up to Toronto and, um, and give her Ike's, uh, Ike's information. <laughs> so what would you guys do, Annalisa? Well, actually, you haven't told me if he, she actually has maculopathy. I mean, is her macula she, unfolded? I think she I mean, does. I, I think because she, has, she has other uh, reasons to have 2080. And if she's born with no real maculopathy, don't rub your eye, you know, don't push on it and do nothing would have been my first thought. Yeah. Now, if the macula is full of folds on the OCT and, and I really think this is part of her visual issue, then it's it's a conundrum. It's it's one of those that I wish I had you close by or I close by or anyone close by to send them. <laughs> Usually I'm the one that gets them. And I sometimes have tried, depending on where I see the flow, if I'm seeing it around the plate, 
or if I'm seeing it around the tube itself, if I have an anterior glep, I would, I would revise it. Uh, if it's more posterior and is the tube draining, then I would try to get that tube to scar. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Leon? Well, I, I think we've got to figure out why the patient's hypotenuse now. It's kind of rare to be several years after the barbell to now be in, have a single digit pressure. So is there an underlying uveitic component uh, that has to be worked out? But if she is symptomatic, has maculopathy, I think we do need to intervene. Uh, traditionally, I would, uh, two options. Uh, I've done successfully exchanging the tube, a bar belt tube for a valve tube, such an Ahmed, uh, to good success. You can use the same sclerostomy if you're happy with the tube placement. Or um, you can also go in and tie the tube off externally Mm -hmm. um, you can loop a uh, rip cord from the posterior aspect. So you can pull that rip cord in the future if you need to. Um, so you can either tie it off with the proline ligature or a vico ligature if you want more permanency with the proline. So I, I would consider exchanging or tying it off externally. Yeah. Devinder, you know what? One of the things that I, I, I found out the hard way uh, in a couple of cases was uh, a small conjunctival erosion posterior. You know, you got to look for it. You got to put some forcing in there and really kind of get the eye looking down and get that lit up and then look at the, the ridge. Sometimes you see, a, you can sometimes see a small area of Seidel if you look closely. Of course, the eye is hypotenuse, so it may not be obvious. Yeah. The pressure to kind of evaluate that. But we, we had a couple of cases where actually that, that ended up being the issue. Yeah. Uh, one of them actually was because the suture that was through the eyelet actually was not buried properly and ended up you know eroding through the conjunctiva causing uh, communication to the outside. So I, I, I think that would be something, I'm sure you've evaluated that. But in the absence of that, We've had a few cases like this too, you know. I mean, Jeb, you know, you can think of a few cases recently where the patients are fine for years and then, you know, they come back and they're low and I think they're probably not secreting as well and, and their outflow and their inflow aren't matching. Um, and I, I moved to basically be really minimalist. I, I, like, I like the idea of, of an ab internal approach. Uh, we typically use like a 2 nylon, little small little stub. It's very simple to put it into the, into the uh, tube, ab, yeah. ab internal, and expect the pressures are going to go up and treat medically. Uh, and occasionally we remove the plug after several months and, you know, allow some healing to occur perhaps and, and things settle down. That's kind of what we've done, but we don't have a lot of series of these and fortunately they're not as common as, um, as other things. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, it's really, I, I think this issue of tube associated hypotenuse can be such a big problem as the aging, with the aging population. And so because of that, actually I've moved away from 350s and I've now really, um, I, I, I'm doing almost exclusively 250s. Uh, but I think I, that's such a key, key clinical pearl um, that I've been burned on before. Because when these pressures, the pressures are low, especially with these, uh, these tubes, you can, it's not gushing like a, a bleb leak. And I got burned. I remember one time I, I had this a similar type patient and um, I, I presented to my partner Ron Feldman and, and he's like, so are they leaking? And I was like, no, I look back there. He's like, he's like, no, did you paint it? And I was like, no, they're not leaking. It's just, it's just low. And he's like, okay, let me take a look. And, you know, and he's so kind and, and, and humble and he gets his little forcing thing and he, he has the patient look down, he paints and then he presses on the eye and you'll be so surprised. Sometimes you'll see just the smallest little defect in the conj that you don't appreciate because the pressure is low. You're not going to see this gushing. So I think that's such a key pearl. I thank you for bringing that up. Um, you know, for me, I have to do something ab internal. So, um, so what I did was this lady had a tube in the sulcus that I put in, uh, but I had to use hooks to kind of get a better view. And uh, I did very similar things. What Ike was saying was, um, let me uh, show a video. Uh, this is a foroproline uh, that I'm kind of blunting um, in a uh, in a way, and this is topical, uh, just some helon and a GV in the eye, and then with microsurgical forceps. Um, uh, I'm going to cannulate the tube and push it in and it goes in pretty easily. And I wanted, I really wanted to kind of completely occlude it. Um, so, so I pull it back out and, um, and I said, okay, I need a bigger bulb. And you really want it to be like a snake swallowing an egg. You really want to be able to shove, it's going to, you're going to see the effort that's required now to get a larger bulb into that, uh, into the, the tube. It takes a little more effort. Uh, but now you know you're completely occluded and you know that also that that suture is not going to fall back into the eye because it's, it's, it's really tightly, um, tightly shoved into that flexible tube. Uh, my microsurgical scissors weren't working that well, so it took a little time to cut that. Um, and then I, and then I, I called it a day and, um, and then I, uh, you know, I, I left, I left the operating room feeling really smart and feeling like a 
freaking champ. And um, <laughs> I almost um, I almost considered calling myself a gas surgeon. You know, um, I was just like, I was going to change my title. It's no longer going to be Devinder Grover tending surgeon. I was going to be, it's going to be Devinder Grover gas surgeon. I was all ready to. The G, uh, the G stands for Grover, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, then the post-op day one, the patient's pressure is 40. So, um, you know, glaucoma humbles you. And uh, then um, I realized why I put the tube in in the first place. And um, so I, you know, I got her back on all of her meds and then her eye was just beat up and just horrible with all these drops. And, and so now I'm like, well, shoot, what do I do now? Do I take out the tube? Do I replace it? Uh, do I trim it? Or, you know, I don't, I don't really learn my lesson. Um, and this has been reported, you know, as Ike was saying, other, a lot of centers are trying techniques like this. Uh, this is a, a, a report out of, out of Korea and uh, other people have reported complete, this is pain cause group, complete occlusion using various suture material. Um, but what I did in this situation was I was like, well, let me see if I can just partially restrict flow. Uh, so I did a very similar thing, but I didn't, um, I didn't, um, and this lady was great. I was telling her everything I was trying to do. And in these kind of situations, if you're open with the patients, they, they really get on board a lot of the times of what you're trying to do. So here, uh, I didn't want to completely occlude. And you can see, I pushed the suture all the way back to the plate. And I'm laying in bed at night and before the case. And I'm like, well, how am I going to prevent this suture from falling back into the eye? Because it's just, it's just there. And I'm thinking, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking I can cut a hole in it and put it through and I'm trying to manipulate it. And I'm like, well, what the heck? Let me just shove it through the wall of the eye of the, of the, of the tube. So I shove it through the wall of the tube posteriorly and it, and it, it stays there nicely. And, and it actually gives me the confidence that it's not gonna migrate back into the eye because it's held into place. Um, and, um, and so, Did you know- Did you make I'm, a little nick, Devinder? And the tip, did you make a little nick in the tip of the tube? Just, you know, with a proline, if you just cut it, um, if you just cut it, it usually has a sharp edge and you can just jam it through the wall of the tube. Hmm. Um, oh. And um, um, that's the first time I did that, but I mean, it is now what I do. So, uh, you know, over the last couple months uh, after post-op, her pressure slowly uh, came up. Uh, her vision went back to what I considered her baseline. I do think, you know, and honestly made a great point. Is this truly hypotony maculopathy or is there something else going on? But I felt based on the appearance of the OCT, and unfortunately I don't have it on, on the slide, that I thought there was a component of hypotony due, causing her maculopathy. She's now 14 months out. Uh, her vision's back to 2060. Pressure's now back on no meds to eight, which I think is better than four. Um, and it, it showed that we can now kind of have complete control. We can completely occlude it or we can partially occlude flow uh, without conjunctival incision. And then I think the little trick to this that just came just as a game day decision now when I was trying to think of how to stop it is, is just poking it through the side of the tube to prevent it from migrating. And this is what the patient looks like post-operatively. You can see there's still some flow to the plate. You can see that suture nicely. And, uh, and I, I just love this picture. It's so freaking cool. Um, to kind of, you can see just that, uh, that, that froling poked through the, the wall How of the tube. How easy was it to get it to poke? That's the question. <laughs> it's, you'd be surprised these tubes are actually very flexible and it just went right through. I mean, I'm pretty strong, you know, so, uh, <laughs> so I, uh, you know, but I, I think, I think it's, uh, it's possible for, for most people. Uh, no, it didn't require any effort. It just poked right through. Um, so, you know, at take home points, you know, this was a case done under topical anesthesia, ab interno, no, no conjunctival incision required. And the key point that I think one additional learning step is, is now we can embed the suture in the wall of the tube to prevent migration. I know, I know. Not instead of like gaining the tube, I know this tube was um, on the sulcos, but most of the old tubes that are now having trouble were in the anterior chamber. And when they are like that, I just pull them out through a paracentesis, tie them up and just shove it back yeah. in. It's yeah. Well, I like, I think what I like here is the, is the, is the being, the ability to titrate. So you don't have to completely occlude. You can partially uh, titrate the resistance to outflow. Yeah, I, I think that's really clever, Devinder. And I think um, one thing I, I have done, although I think this is, I love the ab internal not opening conj is I, I've, I've opened up conj I placed, for example, a 5 or 4-0 uh, nylon suture in the lumen, then did a ligature, 
and pull out that 4.0, right? The luminous 300 microns, a 4.0 uh, is about 150 microns. And so you basically, you can go down by half the size, but that's much more work on the conjunctiva, I think, doing it like this. And the suture size you used was the proline that was 5.0, you said? I used a 4.0. 4.0, yeah, 4.0. Four oh. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and did, you, did, you, did you also um, coagulate the tip? going in or I no? did a little bit a little to bit, provide okay, yeah. it. And, and, and I don't know. I mean, when you look at, you know, the, the a resistance through laminar flow, just a, a, a minor restriction in the flow, I don't think was really causing it. I think it's the longer restriction in the, in the tube. So I just, I think I just bulbed the tip hoping that it would provide us some additional resistance. But now that we poked it through, uh, I still like the bulbing of the tip. I, I don't I don't know why, but I don't think the bulbing is providing the major resistance. I think it's the entire suture through the lumen. So let me give you some food for thought. You know how you go back, if you use a rip cord, I use a 6-0 proline rip cord on my bar belts. And at the four to six weeks, I give a fern doc, say maybe a month later, a year later, the pressure's up, pull the rip cord. Well, it doesn't make a difference if you pull the rip cord after two or three months, but you still have that rip cord, 6-0 proline and lumen, and it really doesn't give you any um, resistance. So your technique is interesting how you can titrate that uh, that bulb technique to get just the amount of flow uh, of resistance. Yeah, I, I I think you might you must be restricting the lumen a little bit smaller because I, I agree even a nine millimeter tube. I don't know if going down half the size one hundred fifty microns is going to be enough for resistance. So I'm I'm guessing you probably you probably have done enough with your proximal and distal manipulation that you have some resistance and turbulence created there. Yeah. Um. Or or perhaps just enough to have it. You know. Obviously obviously it's worked for you. So. Um, I think it's I think a clever one. I, I just wonder whether you could use whether you would consider using um, maybe a slightly larger bore, maybe to get yeah. that lumen, residual lumen, maybe to instead of 150, maybe have it down to 80 microns or 100 microns, which may create more more resistance. Yeah, like a three. I think a th I think I've been when I was doing this, I played with a, a I played with a 4 and a 3 proline. Um, so yeah. I, I you know I think we I think I think there is a role. But Leon, I think I, I love how you think about things. I I, I think there it, you do. Um, you do bring up a very good point was if that pulling that rip cord doesn't provide any additional benefit but i think these patients are different these patients are on the edge where their aqueous production is down just where it tipped the scale to hypotony and um and so maybe you know um patients that have adequate aqueous production aren't aren't on the edge and they're able to um uh to to overcome the difference in resistance. But I and, I, I and I will say that, I mean, you know, and, and again, Jeb, you've seen our tubes. Uh, we typically do a 4 nylon rip cord and a ligature, and we leave the rip cord in there. Now, several months later, the pressure is high. We will pull the rip cord out. Sometimes we don't get a response, but sometimes we do actually. Now I'm using 4-0 though, uh, but we do sometimes see a drop that persists. And I wonder whether maybe it's uh, creating a little area from the bleb, you know, coming out into a larger area because you have the rip cord coming out under the conge, maybe that's what's happening rather than actually changing the resistance in the lumen. But for whatever reason, with 4.0, and we track it, of course, under the conge all the way over into the adjacent quadrant, we pull it out. In some cases, we do get some lowering. And, and again, whether it's because we've opened the resistance more, which from a fluidics level doesn't necessarily make sense completely, considering even with a nine millimeter lumen length may not be enough, or are we just creating another area of outflow because you have a little opening in that bleb, right, that you have the suture going through? I don't know the answer, but but there are some things that we see that um, that that may explain what you're seeing as well, Devinder. We've yeah. done that like a year out, even not even kind of just in the earlier post-operative period with the uh, removing the rip cords and still seeing an effect. So it's been pretty interesting. Yeah. Pretty he, he makes a good point too. Maybe we're clearing out some uh, some some biofilm or some material in the lumen when we pull the cord out. Yeah. And clearing out any resistance there too. That could be a very good rationale for why we're seeing that as well. So that that's true. It's a good point. All those possibilities. Great point. Well, let me let me fly through this really quickly just because it's not it's more just for a thing and I, I again this was I, I played with this just because it's one of my colleagues said that they don't do two uh, bar belts be, uh, because they don't have a qualified assistant to help them isolate muscles and that just made me really sad that their patients aren't getting what they need to have because they're they they're not in a center that provides them assistance so um, this led me to kind of come up with the idea of this double muscle speculum um, and, um, and it really it's allows for a single-handed use. So you basically hook both muscles, you squeeze it, and then you, you can twist this ball so it holds it into place. And then you essentially hand it off to your assistant. And then you have two hands to kind of put the bar belt in. So it's for, I think it's very useful when, in people that are operating at you know, these high volume cataract surgeons centers where they, um, 
uh, where they don't have a, a, an assistant that's used to assisting in, in, in glaucoma. Um, looks, so looks show, barbaric. I'm sorry? Looks barbaric. Yeah, yeah, it is, exactly. It's also a torture technique. I think, um, you know, it's... Uh, so it balances out the ab internal approach with this. Approach. Exactly. Yeah. So you can uh, get the muscles ab interno. And um, no, so what I try to do very is uh, very clever, man. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I, you want to isolate the muscles first. And, um, and then uh, you're going to come in and, and, and then come in with this double muscle speculum and, and hook the superior rectus. And then hook the, the lateral. And then you're going to squeeze it and that lock puts it out and then you do this ball and you can see my big hand come in and, and do this and that's going to basically lock it into place so that you then have complete exposure um, i can't get any of my retina colleagues to try this for a buckle um i think they're just they're so good they don't need the help um but there's my big hand doing that ball to kind of lock it into place and then i hand that instrument off to my assistant and now i have two hands to then um, put in my my bar belt and um, and I, I really think especially uh, you know I'm thinking for for centers that are now using Audi that don't have a lot of um, you know um, experience with tubes I'm hoping this will be uh, a big a big help for them to to have uh, some ease in implanting double winged implants uh, but then yeah. you know uh, it 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 really helps isolate things and without really depending on an assistant and then I'll, I'll after I'm, after I do that I always will pull open and push up to make sure you still have both muscles engaged and you can move the eye. So uh, anyway, all these instruments, like you asked about, this is the email. Mateen is, is my, with Epsilon Instruments. He's, he's really the, the mad scientist behind all these things. I come up with an idea and then uh, I want this thing. And he says, no, you need this. And then we kind of fight and come up with something. And he, uh, he's usually right. I'm usually wrong, but uh, come up with something. And he's, he's really been uh, kind to help uh, me play with all these things. And, um, he has different rates also, I think, for developing countries to, so that these are uh, provided at a, at a more reasonable cost. Uh, I don't have any financial in interest in any of this stuff, but he does donate 6% of sales to our, our foundation. Um, but, you know, I, I think, and again, I, I, I always think back to, to David Epstein when, I, uh, when I'm in clinic and thinking about this, is that, our, you know, if you're not learning every day from your patients, and if you don't think of your clinic as your own clinical laboratory, you're missing out because the patients are challenging you to be better. They're showing you problems. And, if, and, and what we're doing right now is maybe not always the right thing. And, and, and it forces you to, to, to be better for your patients. And, uh, and you know, we're in the golden age of glaucoma surgery. A lot of what Ike has done is, is helped us get there. And, and it's important, you have, to, you have to think outside of the box. And um, you don't have to be comfortable with ab interno. I think glaucoma surgery is gonna be an inside out type of approach. And then do what I do is like, whenever you're thinking of something crazy, um, you know, pull on a colleague with you, if you have it. And, and, you know, you're in the hot seat, trying something new, your colleague with, uh, with wisdom that's not in the hot seat can just sit there and provide you, you know, some, some aerial kind of protection on and thinking while you're kind of in the hot seat and something's happening. It's the best way to innovate. I kind of, you know, and I, I usually lean on my partner, Ron, Fellman as my kind of my invisible safety net. So I'm playing with things and he's using his tremendous wisdom to, to help make all this better. And then also, you know, don't do what I do. Don't, you know, come up, come up with something disposable um, where you don't make money off reusable instruments. Uh, <laughs> that's the American way. Um, so, but random advice, you know, uh, you gotta stay safe. You know, this is such a, a, a challenging and interesting time. And um, it's important to make sure you're taking care of yourselves and, and your families and your patients and your colleagues. And um, also take advantage, you know, I love the seeing, you know, the, the kids coming into the view and Ike's kids, it's so much fun working from home and having these webinars where you can just give your kids a kiss on the, you know, on, on, the, on the forehead and they can watch you do what you do and they can pop out. It's just really giving us a new appreciation for life. It's also important to laugh, you know, and, um, but it's sometimes you get to take, go on walks in your Halloween costumes and, and eat outside and, my wife's also, my wife's an anesthesiologist, a peds anesthesiologist. And the, you know, you bring a lot of this home with you and it's stressful for all of us and they get it. And they get to see why mommy is, we're trying to find proper protection so she doesn't, you know, put her family at risk and why we have to kind of don't have access to proper protection. So, you know, they get it. And, and you know, COVID-19 and global pandemic just roll off our kids' mouths now. I mean, it's so crazy the lingo that they've adopted. 
uh, and stay up to date with the current literature. You know, you might, you guys might have missed this. This is a really impactful <laughs> article um, by Kerry et al. on the use of commercial disinfectants for treating coronavirus orally and sub subdermal. And they went in the janitor's closet and read the warning labels and they realized it will kill you. Um, so, um, <laughs> you know, you may want to try something else. <laughs> but uh, it, makes us, it makes us wonder whether it might be better if coronavirus gave us con conferences on how to stay, keep us safe from, from Trump right now. <laughs> so um, we might be better off with that. But it's also, you know, I think this has given us all a renewed sense of gratitude and, and being thankful for what we have and uh, thankful for our families and our spouses and our friends. And, you know, um, and, and we, you know, we all have different routines every night around the dinner table. We go around the table and, and our, we all state one thing that we're thankful for. And I think it is, it's so easy to get discouraged and, and frustrated by what's going on in the world and what's wrong with things and how we could be doing better. Uh, but I think it's also such a unique time to, to be grateful for what we have. And I'm so grateful that, you know, to be part of, of, this, of this thing, I'm, 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 of this conference and webinars and having, you know, some great colleagues like I'm Lisa and Leon and, and, and Ike and Jeb to help make this happen. You guys, Thank you so much for let, being here. And um, I thanks for your leadership and, and bringing this world together in, in, in Qualcomm and in your segment. Um, and I'm on the wonderful job on your presentation. It was nice to see Rosa and Tom on board too. So thank you all for your time and I hope I didn't go too far over, but I uh, appreciate you being here. That was, that was fantastic, Devinder. Uh, what, a, what a beautiful uh, series of innovations that you've provided us. And I mean, th these, are, these are ideas that uh, you've shown you can take and you can build and you can share and, and you can you know result in great outcomes. And this is my time, of course, here now. So probably heard you say <laughs> that. Uh, and I think your closing was was wow. I mean, it was uh, it was heartfelt, man. And that's uh, that's so reflective of what we are encountering now. And and these are the experiences that I think we'll we'll probably never have together in this way. And I think uh, I'm so happy we can share them. Um, I thought maybe I'd give uh, Leon and, and Annalisa a chance to uh, give some closing thoughts as well as I get mauled by my little one here. Um, <laughs> And, uh, there were a couple of questions. I don't know if you want to address them, but on glaucoma and COVID and visual field testing and things like that. I mean, it's been discussed out there about bowls and how do you clean them or not. And any thoughts on, on what you're doing at Duke and, and, your, and your practices? Yeah, I mean, number one, we try to limit the number of testing um, procedures that we do. Uh, certainly, if you have a patient with severe glaucoma facing surgery, you need to have that information. Uh, so we do continue to do visual fields and OCT selectively. Um, patient wears a mask when he or she does uh, the visual field. Uh, the technicians wipe down the units with um, uh, proper uh, precautions. We, so we, we have a misting unit that you can use to clear, clean the bowl. Zeiss does have some recommendations out there about uh, proper, mm -hmm. proper technique. Um, but uh, our technicians are, are starting to use um, uh, misting on the bowl. Let me know how the misting goes. I've kind of been a little afraid to start the mist, but we do try to change the patient's masks. You know, they come with this little sweater, very thin masks. And, and in order to protect the next patient, we will give them a mask when they do a visual field. Um, and it usually gets a better fit and you get a little less fogging of the lens. Right. Um, other than that, we're limiting it to mostly my patients, I'm the one glaucoma in, the, in our practice, only the ones that really need it. Right. OCTs we're doing on everyone. It's just a clean wipe with alcohol. Yeah. That one we're not wearing. Yeah, we're, we're playing with, I mean, I, I, we, we haven't incorporated fields yet back into our practice. I just, I don't feel comfortable. And uh, I was kind of underwhelmed with the handout that, that Zeiss put out on, on it was really just um, really a little, um, I think they could have done a little bit better on, on providing us further insight. There's the fan and there's just, you know, we know that there's respiratory precautions that have to be taken. I'm not as concerned, you know, I think there's some very good studies out there that, uh, that are showing the, the, that only about the prevalence of, of viral particles in the tear film was only about one or 2% in patients with known COVID. So I'm not as concerned about the tear film, but I think still the respiratory precautions are the most concerning. We are starting to play with some ideas of these, you know, virtual reality goggle 3Ds, uh, uh, virtual reality visual field uh, goggles that I think, I think that's going to be the future for uh, for 
for perimetry. Uh, I think the bowl and that thing, I think that's, uh, that's going to be the, the beta of VHS um, of all the stuff. That's all going away. I, I agree with that. I think I, what do you guys do with multiple. Yeah, we, we, we have the same concerns and we were fortunate. We have, we have the compass visual field, which is like micro perimetry with uh, retinal projection. And so there's no bowl. Um, and so we have one of those and we have a bunch of HFA. So we have to decide how we're going to use them. I, I do have the reservations uh, about, about this. Um, and so we haven't started up yet, but we're actively talking about it. Uh, the, those of you that have the Octopus 600, uh, you know, doesn't have a bowl as well and some of the other technologies. So uh, obviously it's not a great time to go and invest in more technologies, but you know, that's kind of what we have done. I, I think we're going to limit our visual fields though. We're going to really, you know, do them on cohesive. We absolutely have to. And I think the mask thing is critical for the patient to wear. Uh, and I think with adequate warning, I think we're going to have to, you know, almost get a consent from the patient to understand the risks involved and whether they wish to proceed with them. I mean, our, our group is worried about liability as well. If someone were to, to know and contract uh, this uh, from our clinics and what does that mean liability wise? So, these are all things that are question marks, and I and I do agree. I wish the manufacturer would, would very quickly uh, start assessing and testing. John Gorfickel from from Ontario has been talking about assessing the impact of UV and does it really damage the bowl or not. So, um, you know, I think we need to we need to do a lot more work on this and very quickly to kind of figure this out, and particularly in glaucoma. Um, fortunately, OCTs, I agree with Annalise. I think that's at least something we have we can uh, we can count on. Yeah, most of my patients are coped out already, so it's kind of. The OCT is red anyways. I know, I know. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it made us think, you know, when we, you know, um, when we went back and we were talking about this, you know, when, you know, we were doing a lot of these fields on patients that, for monitoring, you know, just for monitoring and, and, and um, we kind of, it's, it's interesting to ask yourself, like, how many times has the field itself pushed you to, to operating on a patient? And are there situations where you could use the nerve and you can use the pressure and the stage of disease just to pull the trigger? Um, and, and how often is the field going to kind of push you over to that limit? But I mean, it's still an essential component of glaucoma monitoring. Um, but it's really, I think all this is challenging us to think differently and, and, and maybe approach things with a different risk profile. But Davinder, today I had a 10-2 that progressed. But the patient was fogging up the lenses. She just couldn't do it. It's hard for these old people to wear the mask. And the truth is the pressure was 11. And I said, come back in two months. And then we'll repeat it. I was not going to start doing a major change on an in-state patient based on a field now. We what? still did it. Well, the reality, may, the reality may be we may be, we may be doing more intervention and, and surgeries for patients where we're not sure, at least having that discussion more earlier with the patient than... Uh, I mean, I personally been a big proponent of, of surgery. I guess I'm biased on that level. Of course, you have to have a comfortable we surgical approach. Surgical approach. Just, yeah, I agree. Well, we have better tools now to use as well. So, but I think it's gonna, it's gonna, it's really gonna change our practices. I think we probably don't fully grasp it yet. So, but thanks for sharing that, um, Amadeep. Uh, thank you for presenting that uh, those series of cases. Great pearls. I think you got things that people are gonna be able to take home and and use right away. And we thank Tom as well and Rosa for being part of the panel as well. Uh, Devinder, great job, man. Thank you very much. You're, you're definitely an honorary uh, gas member. Uh, you know, <laughs> you. not that not there's anything special, actually. <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, you know, we all feel like we're, we're in this together. And I think that's probably the biggest thing that this is this kind of environment and this pandemic has led us to the feeling of camaraderie and working together like never before, because we're all in this together and we're all going to get out of this together. We're going to win this. It will take time, but we're going to win this by the human spirit, by working together. And, and collaborating. And I think we've seen this, you know, time and time again. Uh, and I'm gonna miss these webinars and seeing people and seeing people from around the world. I see, there, I see regulars that come in from Uganda, from Africa, from Connecticut, you know, from uh, all over the world. And uh, it's a real global feeling. Um, not that we would want any kind of harm from this virus, but it has, there are some, uh, some silver linings to it. So thank you very much. Uh, Leon, privileged to have you with us, man, from Duke again. Thank you so much, buddy, Annalisa. You always uh, add, add great flavor to the discussion and great knowledge, so thank you as well. Jeb, buddy, thanks so much, man, for doing this again as well. We, we have a bit of a break this weekend. It's ASCRS weekend, so I hope you can attend ASCRS. Leon is, leads our glaucoma section at ASCRS. He's got a, a program that's planned there as well. Uh, and uh, Otherwise, we'll see you next week, and we'll see you at some, uh, some other webinar somewhere around the world. And Be safe, and, and Godspeed, and stay in touch, everybody. Peace out, and love Be to Be safe, everyone. Thanks, yeah, guys. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Bye, guys.